And then let's go to um, let's go to Zoom and we're just going to mute our microphone for a
Hello, Peter, Olivia. Hello, Coach. How are you? Uh, okay. Just took a, a little stroll to the mailbox. <laughs> Just to check the weather. <laughs> mm. And you noticed it's snowing, did you? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> You know, you know, what do they say? That it's almost like that sugar snow, whatever the difference between. No, no. <laughs> mm. You know, except that, you know, I guess when you look way back at the traditions, that's probably when, you know, that type of fluffy snow would probably be pretty good with some really fresh maple syrup. <laughs> Back before you had quite so much crud in the air. <laughs> For sure. Mm -hmm. Peter, but do you have an idea uh, which state, if, if we have a Vermonter who is being treated for COVID at the hospital, do they get counted in their home state or do they get counted in New Hampshire? Very good question. And I don't know the answer. I know that they would be counted as part of the census for the hospital. If they mm -hmm. were actually in the hospital, mm -hmm. but I don't know if the hospital then reports it back to the home state of origin or what. Mm. Um, 
I haven't played that game, I'm afraid. Okay, I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna check with the health folks uh, because it uh, we're on the border, obviously, and yep. you know with the new variant and just um, you know more cases starting to surface. It was just a curiosity. Um, yeah, who 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 gets the the weird, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a contest you don't wish to win <laughs> for sure for sure so is that Russ getting seated there yeah that looks it looks like Russ yep So, Russ, are you able to hear me? I think they've been having the feedback issues with the sound system again, so they're mm. keeping their microphones quiet. Mm. Well, he, he just sat down, too, so right. he yep. might, not, might not be plugged in yet. Mm -hmm. How you doing, Roy? <laughs> yeah, they might be having some technical issues going on. I think they do. So are you done with the legislature or are they still doing things? Uh, we spent the day today with uh, uh, fiscal review on the uh, global warming solution report, um, housing evaluation. Um, so we started at 10 and went until about three. Uh, so we had... Uh, a really powerful uh, presentation from the state economist. Uh, and that, that's what I was going to share with Russ. Because, uh, you know, this time of year, we're always interested in where the CLA is landing. Yeah. You know, and um, it looks like it's, it's up 8.9%. Ooch. Mm. Yep. So, yeah. we, you know, so it's going to play an interesting role in that calculation, you know, yeah. at the, the end game calculation, even though they factored it, factored it in, you know, to the data that we get, you know, for uh, budgeting purposes. Um, right. But the, the bottom line is the Ed fund will be healthy. Um or I should say healthier than it's been, you know, since <laughs> I can remember. Uh, and a lot of it, it has to do with the, uh, you know, the additional influx, you know, of, uh, you know, federal reserve funds. Right. You know. And I assume also the influx of new residents who have escaped urban America and its COVID issues? Well, that, that's, you know, that's what's got Vermont revenues above projections. You know, we're looking at approximately what did, a 3.5% above target. Hmm. In the midst of everything that's going on. So, yeah. 
so you can understand why people, you know, are going, well, even though they're having their issues, you know, with the variant and changes, they're still doing pretty good. So maybe that's not a bad place to be. Yes. Growing yourself out of your problems is the American way. Too bad it's not ultimately sustainable. Right, right. Mathematically, you're eventually going to run out of growth. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime... Only so many people. (laughs) So do do you hear anything yet, Olivia, from uh, UVM? I have not heard anything from UVM yet. I should be hearing back late December, um, but I have heard back from one of the other schools I applied to, and I got in. Which Congratulations. Thank Which you. One? Which one? Amherst. All right. All right. Yeah. Actually, uh, Dr. Gannon uh, is a professor at UMass Amherst. Oh, awesome. That's one of, one of her other <laughs> projects she does. This is my hobby. <laughs> She likes to wear as many hats as you do. <laughs> hey, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it keeps you going sometimes. Right. Mm-hmm. Russ, can you... Hear us okay? Or have we gone live yet on that part? Seems like he's, they're still having, because before, you know, when it's, when it's working right, it doesn't matter if they're walking around or not, Mm -hmm. you know. starting to get a few people in the audience yeah we started to you know the meeting we had this uh this morning uh, we started playing with some tools you know in uh, in zoom and i didn't realize how easy it was to do a poll actually you know so we created a poll this morning you know to mm-hmm. to look at some variable times and it was pretty cool you know you can actually disaggregate the data and it does it for you right at the, uh, you know, as you're uh, populating the, uh, the poll. Right. Learn a lot about this hybrid stuff as you go along. Oops. So... See Hava or Nancy. Yeah, really. Unless they're in the room and we can't see them. Mm. Let's see, we can see five of the seven seats. So unless they're on that far right hand corner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How you doing, Jacob and James? Good. How are you, coach? Good, good. Yeah, we spent the uh, the morning at the uh, 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 legislative uh, briefing, uh, financial outcomes uh, briefing. Had some really interesting data. Uh, if you if you really want to get geeky, just uh, go to the JFO website, and uh, you know uh, Tom Kavetz. Uh, presentation is uh, there, and and it's some pretty interesting inf- demographic information about what's going on in the state. You know, with with the numbers. Awesome. You know, like eight point nine percent on the uh, uh, CLA raise, sure. and, and then we're three point five percent above target. Uh, on expected revenues statewide. Wow. And so that's, that's a, it'll be roughly $7.3 billion. You know, I can remember when 
you know, our budget was well under three billion. <laughs> so that you know, those are real numbers, you know. But anyways, so are we about ready to? I think Nancy walked in. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I was on VSBA meeting too. Can you hear us, Peter? We can yeah. hear you. Yeah. All right. So, 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 Russ, before we get uh, started, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I uh, just wanted to share, I was talking with uh, Jacob and uh, others earlier, you know, we had the uh, the financial uh, report today uh, from the state economist and it was interesting, you know, uh, the CLA looks like it's going to be 8.9 uh, increase. Uh, expected revenue, state revenue is in the uh, 3.5% over projections. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you get it, if you get a chance, you know, if you want to do the geek thing, it's on the GFO uh, website. Okay, coach. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. Okay, everyone. Right. Looks like it's time to start the festivities. Uh, I'd like to call the December 8th, 2021 Hartford Board of School Directors meeting to order. Are there any changes, additions, and approval? Yeah, uh, um, I believe, um, Kevin, we are going to table the facilities, reserve funds, budget balance, and maintenance. Well, the, the reserve funds, uh, and budget balance. The maintenance and improvements committee, I do have a document tonight for you to consider. I suppose, you, I, I don't know, it's up to the board. Do you want to at least talk about that? We're, we're gonna go, the finance committee met on Tuesday and, um, and uh, had some thoughts on that and tabling it to the next uh, meeting. It's up to Russ and Kevin to decide if yeah. you want to comment on that in that okay. session or table it. Well, I, I think that um, you know standing up the the committee, you know, is uh, is job one, uh, and then uh, if we look back at the planning calendar uh, for our community engagement meetings, um, this coming meeting has time built in to engage the community in where we're at uh, with those budget indicators. So it would seem to make sense, um, you know, to formally, you know, table it if we get a, you know, a, um, a drive by, so to speak, uh, you know, that would help inform people initially. Right. And I, I do have a uh, document I'd like you to consider uh, for the maintenance and improvements committee. I think the sooner I get going on recruiting membership, the better. Cool. Yep. All right. Uh, any other additions, changes? So we are going to stay with that on the agenda and just do a slight coverage not a deep yeah. thing right okay so it basically is no need to change anything i move that we approve the agenda as presented second so we have a motion in the second to approve the agenda uh, all in favor aye. Aye. aye opposed so moved the uh the next item is review of the district's ends policies in relation to uh, current events. And that is the piece that um, Roy and Kathy have been doing for us. I have a little show for you, Coach. I, mean, hey. I took over sharing rights, so Kathy's <laughs> going to start us off with this. Cool. 
Oh, okay, so we're gonna hit the next slide. And as promised, uh, we had mentioned previously that we were continuing with the panorama survey and I wanted to share uh, the results with you all. So we're gonna, we're gonna uh, go over what is actually been asked in terms of the categories and then talk about some of the reflection and action steps that the building administrators and their leadership teams have talked about. And then we'll take some comments and questions. So what did we focus on? We focused on, again, these are the same two areas that we focused on last year, student supports and environment, which includes school climate, student engagement and relationships, and then student competency and well-being survey was the second one. And that covers uh, emotional regulation, challenging behaviors, self-management and supportive relationships. And that really asks students to sort of do a self-evaluation about how they are. Uh, doing with their self, you know, with their own emotion and self uh, well being. So, um, last year's data we compared, so what you're going to see is some charts that compare last fall, winter, and spring. So, the whole entire year. And then, then we looked at last year's spring data and compared it to this fall data. So, you'll see that as well. And then, our January, uh, our next the next time that we're doing the survey, our next window is January 1st to the 21st, the 1st to the 21st. And we're planning on this time also including a family survey and the staff survey during the same window as the student surveys in January. So we'll be able to compare January and or winter and spring, because we'll do that again in the spring. So we'll have some more data from families uh, by the end of the year. We'll happy to share that towards the end of the year. All right, so comparing last fall, winter, and spring, this first survey, again, uh, dealt with student supports and environment. So you can see over these two graphs, the left one is grades three through five, and the right one is grades six through 12. And you can see that there are not any big dips or big rises across the board. So um, kind of maintained at a pretty, pretty good even level. Um, it's just, it's interesting to look at and, and make some no, mental notes in your head about what might be, be going on. Um, the next survey, same thing. Um, Again, no big, huge dips either way. You see some slight rises and some slight dips. Um, so overall last year, we did pretty well to maintain at a, at a pretty even level. This year from um, comparing the spring to the fall, I think that's the next one. Um, Again, it's interesting to think about what happened over the summer too. And I think we wanted to look at this data specifically because we did put some things in place over the summer, some supports um, that we talked about before the summer programming and wanted to see really sort of, did it make any kind of an impact? And again, there's not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of difference. Um, again, no big rises or big, big tips. And the same with the second survey. And so we asked, we gave this data to the administrators of each building and, um, and their leadership teams and asked them to do some reflection. And so, and identify some next steps. So not just reflecting on the data, but what are you planning to do to remediate or to continue an upward, an upward gain growth and then anything else they wanted to share with us. So we're gonna share that with you. And um, at the elementary schools, they saw, these are their reflections. They saw gains over most categories from last year. They noticed that school climate was a new area for growth. There was a high positive rate for peer to peer and staff to student relationships. And that's no surprise because that's what they've been working on, right? That was our focus. 
Even though this year has been challenging for staff, students reported a 90% favorable response rate around the perceived teacher in excitement. Overall, student engagement scores were in the top quintile. Uh, they were surprised about some of the teacher-student relationships. If you walked into your class upset, how concerned would your teacher be? That was about a 56% um, that they, the 56% felt that they, their teachers would be concerned if they saw them walk in upset. Some of the scores were around 60% positive and were in the 80 to 90th percentile nationally. Um, and the act, the sections on challenging feelings and emotional regulation were comparatively low. The challenging feelings positivity rate was two percent points higher than the spring administration. Uh, and the short answers revealed that there was a wide range of what kids were experiencing. So sort of all over the place. Um, some of their next steps, they're going to try to get to the root cause. And the, their hypothesis is that if we support teachers and their stress load, students will notice and feel a relief and the school climate scores will improve. Um, and they're gonna develop a circle protocols to learn more about the students' thoughts around the scores and challenging feelings and emotional regulation sections. They're gonna model circle protocols that promote feelings of belonging reteaching focus on emotional regulation, looking at individual level student data to help find ways to serve students better, such as establishing more adult connections, following up on kids in crisis and protect confidentiality, reflecting data back to students and letting them know that if X applies to you, here's who and what is available for your support. They may need an idea of what choices that are available so also, so essentially letting kids in on it, right? So letting kids know that these, these are your scores and, and these are some of the things that you can do to help yourself. Making sure students understand the questions. So we're thinking that perhaps some of them don't understand the language in the question. Mm -hmm. And so reading them aloud to students and being able to scribe will give them a better opportunity to get some of those short answer questions uh, or the answers to them in a better way. So if they have somebody that they can tell their answer to that's typing it in, we'll get more information that way. And then what else? Uh, most of our scores place us in the top two tiers of percentile. And we're really proud and excited that we're able to do this despite the challenges that we're facing. And I'm gonna let uh, Roy talk about the middle and high school. So um, from the middle school, uh, some reflections, uh, engagement remains low. Um, they have seen a dip in student teacher relationships and climate from the spring, which may be attributed to both to the less of a team structure and no longer having close pods from last year. So st students feel less connected overall. Uh, there was an increase in student engagement last spring around the time we implemented the school-wide project-based learning unit. I don't know if you folks remember that. That was one of our ENDS report outs in the, in the spring. It was um, highly successful with the kids, and I think they're attributing some of the data to that as well. Um, and students continue to struggle with emotional regulation. Um, some of the next steps they're looking at. Um, They've restarted student council with three branches. They have a student equity, community connection, and school spirit. And they also created a newsletter slash yearbook group. Um, the instructional coaches are offering a weekly coffee, coffee house chat with teachers after school. Uh, last month's focus was on relationships and this will be on uh, engagement. Um, they're creating a, um, a site which when, when I have that, I can share the link with you folks. I'll just email it to you so that if you wanted to see um, how they're rolling that out at the middle school. Um, so they're uh, focusing on student engagement in their instructional practices for many observations. And this will be a focus of their professional learning. Uh, teams and teachers are building in emotional and self-regulation work into their daily routines with short-term goal setting with students, explicitly focused on building social emotional skills. Uh, they continue to encourage teachers and teams to engage in project-based learning opportunities to increase student engagement. 
in their what else category, uh, one of the things they've talked to the staff about is how um, they're trying to build community. Uh, team structure has always been a huge part of relationships, community, and climate at the middle school. And COVID has really shifted their ability to engage as teams in the same way. Last year, pods took the place of team structure with most students having an opportunity to feel bonded with their pods and their teachers. Uh, now they're no longer have the pods in the same way, but also are, no long, are not able to engage with teams in the traditional way, such as field trips, weekly activities, et cetera. Um, this is presenting a new set of challenges for them to figure out and how to navigate the needs of a middle schooler and how to help them feel a sense of belonging in the community within the school. But also remain, but also resume some structures like rotating classes that are part of being a middle school student. Um, so, um, a lot of what they're seeing is it's it's not the same structure as pause where it was where it's very confined. But they're not able to provide the the flexibility of being able to to go to different classes and and to have you know my math class isn't the same as my social studies class. So they're they're really uh, trying to navigate some of that right now. Moving to the high school, um, the data reports were similar over the past three iterations of the survey. Engagement as defined by the survey remains low. Uh, students continue to struggle with emotional regulation. Um, some of their next steps, they've directed the school counselors to check in with students based on their needs articulated in the survey. Um, putting together a team of students who will work in advisories to share the data and create next steps and rec recommendations based on the information. Uh, meeting with department chairs and plan to, on using panorama data to tell the current conditions of the school. Um, our teachers are currently completing the panorama for, for the staff from the Teton School and our families will be completing the family survey in January meeting with counselors weekly to review attendance, grades, and panorama data in regards to targeted interventions for students and screening. Um, and there, what else? Uh, the data suggests that there's little change in the way of our students' responses to the survey. One of the goals of the student-led advisory-based work will be to provide a better sense of the tool and how we can support students in the areas that are identified by the student team. In addition to student data, we'll also be receiving staff and family, which will provide an opportunity to crosswalk the responses and look for trends. So that's the, the reflections from, from the different grade levels. Um, do you folks have any questions or any of folks in the do. audience? <laughs> Can I, Maya, go ahead. Absolutely. First of all, what are short answers? Kathy, you, you were talking about in the K through five grades, mm -hmm. something about short answers. I don't know what short answers are. Oh, uh, so in the survey, there are two sections of the survey, sort of a multiple choice okay. and then a short answer where they, they get to just free write. It's an open-ended question. Yep. Okay, super. May I keep the floor for a minute? Because I do have sure. a couple more questions. Sure. In the K through five, how did the kindergartners and the first graders who don't they, read take the test or take the survey? Uh, it's actually not K through five. It's oh. three through five. Three through five. Mm -hmm. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. I thought it said three. And I'm thinking, boy. Yeah. Smart no, kids here. <laughs> <laughs> Taking this survey. Yeah. Um, Oh, and Roy, yes, uh, on the coffee chats, yes. did a lot of, was there a large number of teachers that came to that or that are coming to it? So the, um, the next coaches meeting is coming up next week. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, uh, one of the topics in the agenda. So I haven't seen the share out yet in okay. terms of the response. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, after next week, I'll have that answer for okay. you. Okay. I would be curious to see. Mm -hmm. How many respond yeah, to it? <laughs> to have that opportunity to yeah. go and do it. Okay, mm -hmm. that's my only questions. Thank you, uh, Olivia. Thank you. Um, 
Which of the surveys about student emotional well-being are confidential and which ones are tied to like you specifically through your name? I just remember there being a lot of different surveys about student well-being and some are confidential and some aren't. So Olivia, I'm gonna take, take a step up. My guess is the, that you're thinking of the YRBS survey is the one that's 100% confidential, but right. taking, taking back information on, on the high school students and the panorama data is directly tied to your name. So, so a counselor could pull up an individual student if they, if they wanted some data on them. Thank you. I just didn't remember which one was which. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Coach? Yes. Um, one, this is one of general observation. Going forward, can we have a cheat sheet on acronyms? You guys in that engineering nice education yes. love acronyms, and <laughs> I understand you use them all the time. Mm -hmm. That way, and for any document, I mean, of course, they're not going to cover everything, but reasonably. Absolutely. Good point. Yes. Um, the next question I have is since we're in budget season, and this is be for <laughs> Tom and Roy, um, is there anything else we can do to support engagement in the middle and high schools? Because I know from way back when, with, when I was at school with Fred Flintstone, if I wasn't engaged, <laughs> I wasn't studying. Well, I would say that um, right now, a lot of what we're using our ESSER funds for are when opportunities at the different buildings, whether it be at the, at the, the K through 12 at any level, if someone has an idea where they think they can engage a population that is 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 vulnerable to be disengaged that's that's how we're categorizing it and we're we're trying to find the funds for it we haven't struggled to do that as of yet okay um one of the things that if i were to bet the student group at the high school level will probably come back with some ideas and i and i would bet tristan's probably going to come to us with some some ideas around the project-based learning because um two things on that one it costs costs cost money to, to do that more than in traditional classrooms. But two, she's also integrated the Pathways program that I mentioned to you a couple, mm -hmm. couple meetings previous, where she's trying to create some individual pathways at the middle school level as well. Thank you. Right, and I was just gonna remind them of, of Christian Street. You know, when we think about the, I think we talked about this at a different meeting, you know, in terms of outdoor, you know, boosting up our outdoor education opportunities. Mm -hmm. And with the ESSER funds, it's great seed money, but it's also nice to hear you talk and think about how do we continue mm -hmm. after that seed money is gone. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. And, it, and it's also in addition to what Roy and Kathy said, engagement has become much more of a, uh, a targeted item for classroom teachers and administrators mm -hmm. to look for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in my day in the classroom, the teacher taught the material and you know if you weren't paying attention you didn't get it and you didn't do well on the test <laughs> now things have shifted so much that i mean something that a teacher or administrator has to be acutely aware of yeah. is the child or the student engaged which means that they're learning and they're paying attention and they're getting something from the class so it's a it's a much more you know important component mm -hmm. i think of what people are doing so, you know, we just realize that if they're engaged, there's less behavior. If they're engaged, they're learning, they're growing, they're moving forward, doing, you know, making themselves better. It's a much bigger uh, topic. Peter. Oh. So, prefacing my remarks by noting that there is very little data, so we don't have trends yet. Uh, and also that we are living in interesting times. Um, perhaps bringing to mind the ancient Chinese curse or the reported ancient Chinese curse. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the context of these surveys and how they help us. Um, perhaps if we were able to see the results in the context of the national data or state data, we could have some idea of what it really means about us. But in isolation, I'm having a very hard time deciding whether flat from year to year in the time of COVID means congratulations, we're holding on 
and we haven't fallen over a cliff, or it means things have been bad and they continue to be bad. I just don't have any way to tell how to interpret the data in what context. I guess a question, you know, to follow up on that uh, to Roy and Kathy uh, is <clears throat> there's only three observations that have been done because as we look at the, you know, the data uh, graphs that you put forth, there were only three, uh, let's say, test points. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't really have uh, that, that deep uh, uh, accumulation of data yet, you know, to kind of refer back to, is that, am I? That's correct. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. But but Peter's point is is well taken too. You know, like if we had indicators, you know, as to uh, even regionally. Uh, so you, you know, yeah, but. it was mentioned that for the elementary schools that some of the scores we had were in the ninetieth percentile yeah. nationally. Yeah, that would I assume imply that in fact we're doing relatively well. As we well at least compared to our peers and give some context, but that was the only point where there was really any contextual information that would allow one to interpret what this might mean. So if we could in future reporting outs on this, provide some kinds of context to say how well we think this means we're doing, what areas we are you know, above average, below average, or whatever, it, it starts to provide some means of assessing how this could help us. Yeah. We, we realize too, I mean, no, I think you're absolutely right, but we also um, realize that this data is, and this assessment, if you will, is relatively new. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Yeah, so, that was right. By trying to create sort of a body of past past assessments and that comparison, I think it will prove to be more helpful uh, helpful as we go forward. I mean, it right. is helpful to know that we haven't um, sort of digressed from last year. We know how right. difficult last year is. My my um, concern is that we haven't increased or improved drastically because if you remember last year the elementary students were a shortened day the middle and high school were every other day so I would have expected to see some improvements but again that's that's what you do with data right you try to make a hypothesis and see if it's true or false and you know so it's going to be interesting in the spring where we are yeah right you now right Again, yeah. the whole later in the meeting, we're going to talk about how we entered the school year thinking it was going to be so much better. And it turned out to be the same or maybe worse than last year so far right. or harder right. than mm -hmm. last year. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's how this data is. And it, it is helpful to compare year to year and it will be better once we have multiple years. But again, Peter's point is well taken. Like, where are we compared to the, you know, the rest of folks who take this assessment. Yeah, I made a note of that. We had definitely have that data and we'll be sure to include mm -hmm. it uh, in the spring when we yeah. report back. And the acronym, uh, it would be helpful. <laughs> yeah. um, Coach, there are a few people online in Zoom uh, that have questions and what we thought we'd do tonight um, was, you know, let them raise their hand and then see if you have a question, of course, you know, you don't have that public comment on the agenda until later. So one, do you want to entertain public comment now? And two, just to remind people in uh, the Zoom meeting, uh, you need to state your name, your full name, and where you live. So you have to be a Hartford resident. I don't know how you want to handle, uh, there's a few questions. But again, if you entertain yeah. questions throughout the agenda, it could be a very long meeting. But <laughs> well, I, I think what I'd like to do is if uh, uh, the our guests wouldn't mind uh, holding their questions until uh, the public comment 
uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, that will allow us to get uh, this body of information, you know, out uh, because we do have a lot of information that's coming. So I think that that would probably be best at this point. Thank you. Coach, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, thank you. First of all, thanks for presenting this information. I find the panorama information really interesting. I just have a couple of small questions. Well, I have one small question, one maybe bigger question, <laughs> not for tonight, but for thinking about. Um, what is, when we're looking at the high school kids, do we, do we assess any information about uh, their graduation preparedness? And I'm thinking here about um, how do they feel about when school's over? What happens next? Are you anxious about when we're done? Um, that kind of information. Is that assessed at all? So I don't want to, there is, there is one. I, I wouldn't be able to speak fluidly on it, okay. but I can absolutely get you that information because I know that there is, um, they have a survey that I know that it's part of the graduation process that you come in, you, you, you they do some photos, you hand in your survey, you do this, you do this, <laughs> and you get your diploma ready. So I know that there's, there is a survey that they collect as part of that process. What's on the survey, I wouldn't be able to. So it's not necessarily part of the panorama package no. where we're looking at well-being. Right. Good thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's but interesting. You know, do the, the, the armed services uh, assessment, that's, it's sort of a misnomer because that's what it was all about is your... Uh, you know, technical aptitude. Mm -hmm. and yeah, ASVAB. the as the yeah. ASVAB. Exactly. And that was pretty helpful. Another enactor in them. ASVAB. <laughs> okay. I don't know if we still do anything like that, but that was very helpful. Yeah. 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 And I don't think the wire the BS gets into that. No, it's more. This is and panorama really is designed more for Social emotional well-being, yeah. not yeah. you know like that. But right, right. But, and we're also, but we are able to add question, add questions to it. We're able to like tailor mm -hmm. the uh, the survey to to some degree. So that actually, we'll make a note of that. And I mean, it might be something that we could ask along those lines mm -hmm. that we could capture. Within that, within that survey, mm -hmm. actually, without making it too long, you know. But yeah, yeah. it might be interesting. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about budget season. I'm thinking about ESSER funds. Yeah. That, that mm -hmm. it's money, sort of that one-time project money. Yep. And I'm wondering about our generations as they're coming up. And I would expect that each of these three groups might, at some point, show us some trends mm -hmm. of need. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be nice? If we had some ideas and some money and some budget to be yeah. able to combine to be able to um, provide support for the need that emerges from each of these three groups. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I think it's really important to remember that K2 group too, which we're already seeing and talking about trends that don't show up in Panorama because they don't take it. Yeah, they <laughs> so targeting <laughs> targeting those yeah. those needs and trends as they're coming up, I think is really mm -hmm. critical for us as a body to be able to do forward thinking because getting on that now saves us so much time later. I think something uh, in the K2 would be very interesting. I don't know how you would get that information. So I can speak a little bit to the K2 through two data. Generally, what we, it's not like we don't assess them, but we have so much behavioral data that we use with the Swiss, uh, which is a the data collecting system that they use. Um, and an infinite campus. So we do have data. It's just not uh, in the form of a survey because as you can well imagine, taking a, right. a survey to a kindergartner <laughs> is pretty difficult. And the language that's involved with right. the survey too, they don't really understand what you're asking, but mm -hmm. we do have other data that we look at. So that's- We have a lot of data. We have a lot of behavioral data and um, emotional uh, self and well, is that based on the observation yes, from the teachers and stuff? It's more that anecdotal are, and the behavior, you right, know, our tier twos, right, okay. our, you know, right. our interventions, uh, yeah. all of that is captured. Yep. Yeah. And it is a, it is a combination. Yeah. Uh, when we do the uh, spring reporting uh, and the action planning, um, the additional uh, data sets are talked about mm -hmm. uh, during that time yep. uh, from the elementary uh, 
uh, principles. Yeah. Right. The, the other thing, Coach, uh, that Hava, Hava should know is um, for years, the, the board and I have um, been curious about graduation data. So sort mm -hmm. of post-graduation uh, yeah. happens to our students. Are they successful? Do they do what they said they were going to do or do they... Do they not do that and do nothing? Go, to, you know what? What? What's what's going on? What happens? Yes. Do we know yeah. how successful we are, or if we need to do more, or you know what changes could we make in our program so that uh, we're more helpful? Uh, both it. Peter, both Peter and Russ have asked that question. Uh, usually in the spring when we're getting our assessment. Uh, you know, of the programs uh, at grade level. Uh, so uh, it's, we're on time, I think, in the, in the schedule of things. Uh, just a quick note, uh, the ASFAB test that was being referred to is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. I remember it from my my high school <laughs> days, many, many, many decades ago. Yeah, there was one of those assessments that he. I mean, I know, I know it sounds completely different than what it actually does, but um, it did. You had a bunch of questions, and in the end, it, it was uh, correlated to you know what aptitudes um, a student had, so they were. Mm -hmm strong in this or weak in that or strong in this is sort of exactly what what careers might be a good idea given the skills that they indicated or you know if they wanted to be a pilot but you know they didn't have those sort of technical skills to uh support that you know the counselor or the teacher or everyone could try to persuade them like you know maybe you should have some other options because yeah. that might be really difficult not not to you know mm -hmm. Well, that's no, 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 but it was just to be like a reality check. Yeah. Of, I mean, that's the kind of thing that can go hand in hand with mm, the PLP system too, exactly. right? It's not a good idea to be a doctor if you hate science. Right. <laughs> that, <laughs> that sort of thing. That's an exaggeration, yeah. but that was the point. Right? Exactly. And as, I re and as I recall, they ranked you percentile of everybody who was taking the test. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that mm -hmm. that yeah. would be a means of evaluating our graduates mm -hmm. with... Yeah. Or something like it. I mean, not yeah, it. yeah. And, and just, I'm sorry if I could. Just no, go, go go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that I, that it's clear that I'm also asking about how do students themselves feel mm -hmm. about their preparedness for right. graduation? Because mm -hmm. as someone who, I'll admit, I have a high schooler at home. That is something that we talk about about how do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. um, because. Mm -hmm. Uh, even back in Fred Flintstone days, <laughs> you know, when we were all in school, there's some. I remember there is some anxiety that happens about going forward into the world, and it's possible that our kids are now experiencing um, quite a bit of that because the world is a little bit different, and parents maybe don't exactly know how to even guide students in the mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want to belabor this subject, but one of my uh, real interest is finding out what our students are doing and how well they're doing. Mm -hmm. So when I see one of our recent graduates at the school visiting or wherever, I'm always like, so how are you doing? Do you feel like you were well prepared? You know, you're in the science program. How do you think our science program supported you or prepared you for the, what you're doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and I go through that just to try to find out if you'll you know, well prepared because it's they usually are like that's on the tip of their tongue. Mm -hmm. like, oh my yeah. goodness, I went into bio in my college and I was way ahead of everyone else because Mr. So and so did all this, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, and I mean, really another nice source to... for some of that data would be the parents because, <laughs> because, yeah, I know from talking with three children. They tell me, well, this I was nowhere near prepared mm -hmm. type thing. Right, right. And they talk about their peers having so much more homework in high school than they did type thing. Mm -hmm. or, so, or our labs are, are inadequate or yeah. the writing. Uh, I, I had to go to the lab because I didn't have the writing skills that I needed. Or, like, mm -hmm. 
Olivia? Thank you. Um, I remember freshman year being given a survey through um, the Naviance system that sounded very similar to the aptitude test that you guys are all talking about. Um, is that survey still being given out? Oh, no. I don't, I, that was a big, that was, uh, I'll have to check on that, Naviance, because so. we were using that. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, the other aspect of the Armed Services Battery, vocational battery test was it was used by the Armed Services to determine who they wanted to recruit. That's right. I got a lot of socks out of it, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, well, thank you very much. And uh, the, uh, the next uh, order of business is the uh, student representative report. I'm going to pull thank up uh, Olivia prepared a presentation. So uh, Roy is going to pull that up. Uh, well, Mr. Hathorne is pulling that uh, presentation up. Um, this past week at the Harvard High School has been a uh, very intense one and a week almost like no other. Um, I, many people may have heard it in the news or read it in the newspaper or heard it through a community member, um, but on Friday there was a bomb threat discovered against the high school. Um, and this has been very significant in impacting student life um, and the way that many of us feel about our campus. Um, and this has become a very, very central part of how a lot of students are feeling right now and what a lot of students have to say about their safety and the school as a whole. Um, I believe Mr. Hathorne is pulling up the presentation. Sorry, Olivia, right now my computer seems to be crashing, so I'm oh. <laughs> I may be able to share it from my end. It's in the folder. I think, I think he's, he's there. I'm getting close. Getting close. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Olivia, bear with me one second. <laughs> By the way, uh, while we're waiting, Olivia informed me when I picked her up from school today that she had a more than normal amount of homework to do. So I suspect she may be disappearing after this report. <laughs> uh, she did share that with, uh, with Tom and I. We expect that from our student representatives. They're usually yeah. students that are involved in everything. <laughs> We're up and live, Olivia. Fantastic. Um, as I mentioned previously, on Friday, there was a threat against the school um, that was discovered. Uh, and this very significantly impacted student mental health and student perceptions of safety within the school. So on Monday, um, which is the, the day that the threat um, claimed uh, would the, the threat of violence would be enacted, there was a significant decrease in the number of students who were attending school that day. So uh, all of my classes had significantly reduced numbers of students in them. On Monday, um, there was a very swift policy that you could not bring backpacks into school. Um, and there was a presence of um, a member of the Vermont um, bomb squad at the school. Um, and so there were a lot of procedures in place that were protecting students. And many of these have been scaled back as we've gotten further away from that initial threat. Um, but one piece of safety policy that is staying uh, is random bag searches. So while students are now allowed to bring their bags to school the same way uh, we did before, there is that new policy in place. Um, and clubs and extracurricular activities are still allowed to meet, um, which has given students a good way to bond with each other and talk about their shared experiences um, and a lot of fear and frustration that they were feeling um, and put it into really healthy ways. So there are a couple different uh, topics of interest both for students um, and then also from the more administrative level at the Hartford High School. Um, a big 
there are a lot of big student concerns that are coming out of this recent threat of violence. Um, there are a lot of questions in general, um, like, uh, is campus safe? Are we going to have to remake this day of school? Um, and there's just a lot of uncertainty in general. But a couple big areas of concern from the students um, is balancing school safety with student privacy. So questions like, um, how often will I have to get my bag searched? Uh, who will be searching my bag? Um, stuff like that. But then also to um, questions about how long police are going to be staying on campus. Uh, will they be here all year? Do they have guns with them? Questions like that uh, are starting to come up in the school. Um, a big focus of the uh, board meeting on the 23rd was how to support teachers. Um, and there was a lot of discussion in that meeting about supporting teachers at the elementary school level. And administrators at the high school level are also focusing on this issue. Um, and they are coming up with um, both what, figuring out what students, uh, or sorry, what teachers need, but then also figuring out ways to respond to those needs appropriately. Um, and another big uh, topic within the Hartford High School community is mask wearing and how uh, mask fatigue has really impacted mask wearing compliance. Last year, there were very few issues of um, mask policy non-compliance, and this year they've been becoming uh, slightly more commonplace. And so the uh, school administration and teachers uh, and community as a whole are really trying to figure out how um, we can get that compliance back up and how we can make school uh, a really safe and positive community going into uh, the emergence of another variant. I wanted to touch on a couple areas that I really appreciated and share um, the thoughts and um, real uh, gratitude from the school community. The first topic um, that I really would like to um, highlight as being something that I really appreciate is how uh, much the administration was communicating with students and parents throughout um, this incident of a uh, threat of violence against the school. There were regular emails from both Mr. Fogg, the Hartford High School principal, as well as Mr. DeBalzi. And these emails were really essential to students feeling safe, parents feeling comfortable sending uh, their students to school. Um, and just really being able to efficiently put an end to rumors um, and make it so that we as students could make an informed decision um, and felt like we were well informed um, and we felt like we had trustworthy, reliable information that we could use to move forward. Another thing that I would really like to highlight is how um, Mr. Fogg and the rest of the school administration worked very quickly to share mental health resources with the student body at Hartford High School. So specifying in emails um, that school counselors and clinicians are there to talk with us about um, how we're feeling um, and making sure that everyone within the Hartford High School community is able to be as resilient as they can be. And that being said, the students of Hartford High School and my peers have been incredibly resilient throughout all of this. Um, and it really is incredible how quickly we felt like we can go back to normal and we've come together um, as a real community and been able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, hope you can hang on for just a couple minutes because some of my report hopefully will answer some of your concern. Okay. So uh, unless there's questions for Olivia, uh, Tom, would you Oh, Peter. sorry, not a, a question for Olivia, but a comment. With respect to the bag searches, uh, it would be my hope that they continue uh, only as long as there's actually a justifiable need for them and that they not become part of the normal day-to-day -day activities in the school. And also, I would uh, hope that we can be sure that the randomness of the bag searches is, in fact, random and that uh, minority and other populations don't end up get disproportionately targeted, which can happen. Okay. Cool. All right. Tom? All right. 
Um, so thank you, Olivia. Um, you know, one of the topics I was going to discuss in my piece is obviously the bomb threat. Um, and for those of us who have been through a few bomb threats, unfortunately, um, you're always trying to strike a balance. Um, you have a bomb threat, which means that you had a threat against, you know, in the high school, uh, because the tech center is connected, it's probably well over 800 people. So you have a, a threat to the safety of 800 people that um, I'm sort of in charge of. I, mean, I am in charge of that safety, and I take that really seriously. And um, you're trying to balance the safety of all those people with the freedoms that we all enjoy in America. Um, and, and that's not something that I take lightly at all. I don't enjoy having a dog at the front door of the high school. It's trained to sniff bombs. I don't enjoy or having a policeman at the front door of our high school when we never have a policeman at the front door of our high school or asking students to leave their bags outside and um, or not take bags into the school. I don't think anyone likes doing that, but when we think about the safety uh, and the threat to someone's you know, livelihood or life, um, you have to do things uh, that are necessary to, to uh, keep people, people safe. And I mean, most superintendents, most teachers would, would just be devastated to have somebody get hurt under our care. So it's an awesome responsibility. And, um, you know, we, Mr. Fogg and I talked all weekend about how to handle this with uh, the utmost care and concern for the students and staff and the community. And, and also the utmost care about their freedom and privacy and, and the rights we all enjoy. So I just want people to know that we talked a lot about how to do this. And, and when you have a dilemma like this, you know, what I tell Mr. Fogg, what I tell the other administrators is as hard as it is, you, you veer on the side of caution. I can defend being over cautious. I can't defend not being cautious and having something happen and someone get hurt. I, I, that would be indefensible for me. I wouldn't be able to face the students, the community, the board. So if you want to accuse me of being overly cautious, I can handle that. Uh, the last place I want to be is careless and have somebody get hurt. So um, it's hard and it's hard. And I know students didn't come because they were scared. I know um, parents didn't want to send their students because they were scared something might happen or they didn't like the fact that there would be such a police presence. That's the balance we try to strike. And I, I really, I think the administration uh, did an excellent job. Um, the searches, and again, they're not something we want to do or we want to continue. They're not, they're random in the way that, uh, you know, if we have a suspicion or we have a, uh, a tip that somebody's got something or somebody um, might be up to something, then, you know, we might search the bag. Um, again, we don't like it, but we got to keep kids safe. We got to keep all of you safe. Um, when you're in the school, your parents have, have given us, um, you know, the rights that they have to keep you safe, the rights that they have to keep the children safe. That's, you know, in, in a local parenti. So it's an awesome responsibility that we all take really serious. And uh, Mr. Mr. Fogg, I know, takes that very, very seriously and does a really good job of that. And he's very concerned about uh, your, your rights and your freedom. Um, again, so I hope that explains a little bit about uh, why it was so intense. Um, I think it is getting back to normal. I think the attendance is coming back to normal. We, we do have, it's a state law, actually, that you have to have more than 50% of the population in the school for the day to come. Um, and I say that not to alarm people, but um, it's something I need to check. We ran into this last year with some of the COVID days. So I will be checking on that, uh, looking at the data, seeing what percentage of students we did have, um, what Dan French, the Secretary of Education, uh, thinks about you know what happened and why we didn't have 50%. Um, 
I'm trying to figure that out. I think it's too early for me to tell you how we're going to manage that day as far as attendance. Um, so uh, as far as the masks, that's definitely something that I've seen this year is uh, slacking a little. Everybody's got COVID uh, fatigue, sick of wearing them. So they're sliding down under people's noses. We've got to sort of reinvigorate that. We've got to get people to you know, uh, pay attention a little more. I think with this new variant, it's highly contagious. They haven't said it, that it's more dangerous, but it is more, much more contagious. Um, so we have to be extra vigilant with that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is COVID cases. A lot of people in the community and teachers and students are probably sick of seeing my letter. That is a form letter that we created uh, from the Department of Health letter. I'm obligated to send that to all of you. Um, it has a lot of good information, but you might have seen it a few times. Just know that each time you get that letter, that means one case. So there's a case you get a letter like that, that's a case in the high school. It doesn't mean there's 50 people or 100 people. It could be two. We have several that are very, very small, but we have to notify you that there was a case. Um, the contacts, the close contacts to the case have already been identified. They've already been notified. So they've already been told they've got to quarantine or they've got to show proof of vaccination or see a doctor or whatever it is. But that's just sort of a warning for the rest. The, yep, there was a case in the tech center. Um, doesn't it doesn't imply that there's 50? You know, most of the cases are very small because a lot of more people are vaccinated. But um, I can't tell you how many, and I can't obviously tell you who it is. Um, let's see. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about tonight. Oh, one more thing is. Um, transportation, we are trying to share any delays. And again, I'm sorry for the inconvenience and the, the trouble it causes the students and the parents, but we are uh, still having some shortages. And if a driver is sick or has a personal day or whatever other reason they can't do their route that day, we generally do not have anyone to fill in for them. So um, that's when you see a delay. So that means another driver is taking the route after they do his or her route. And we've been trying to uh, move those around. The reason why that's not that easy and you've seen certain routes picked on is because that, that's the driver who's out. So that means somebody else has got to move from their route, take that route, and then either do their route later or do the, the route where someone's absent later. So it's it's not just a... Oh, yeah, well, I'll just pull Roy and he'll do this route and this one will do that. They don't know each other's routes. I mean, they know them somewhat, but then they're, they're not that familiar with, you know, yes, Johnny's usually at the curb at 815. And, you know, there's a lot of details to bus driving. Everybody thinks it's some easy thing. It's not that easy. And Tuesdays and Thursday, Hava doesn't come. And, you know, Russ comes and he gets goes home. And so I got to stop at this street because he's only here. You know, they remember all that stuff. It's a lot of details. So we're doing the best we can. We have shifted this week so that we had two Queechee routes late Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, a Dothanbrook route is going to be late. Next week, we'll switch it up if we have to. Um, so that everyone's sharing in the, the, the delays. Um, that's that's my report in this uh, section. Questions, concerns, thoughts? Yeah, I have one question, Tom. So it's school by school, the 50% rule? Or is yes, it just school okay. by school? Okay. Yes, if it was district, we'd have nothing to worry about. Exactly. We came close early in the season. We had a very close call at Dalton Brook School, and there's a lot of COVID quarantines, but we didn't we didn't fall below fifty. Okay, so the the next um... coach. Oops, if I may. Yes, just want to say I appreciate the uh, balancing act that uh, superintendent and. Uh, Mr. Fogg have had to do in terms of uh, security of the students and invasion of privacy and so forth. That's a very hard line to walk. 
Mm-hmm. And I think they made the right call. Yep. Uh, it's, it is difficult having been in that chair personally. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably the most difficult thing you have to do in your work, you know, um, but necessary. Thank you. Um, so let's see, we're at the uh, state of the uh, governance process, um, item number four, section four, policy GP2, uh, state of the district response to community engagement, meeting concerns uh, and letters. Uh, I just wanna take a moment before I ask Tom to, uh, 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 to work through uh, this section. Um, after reviewing, oh geez, 37 pages of uh, uh, notes from that, that meeting and the letters, uh, I just felt uh, compelled to uh, put a, uh, a graph together, which I shared with the rest of the board. Uh, and hopefully that helped frame uh, some of the consistent thoughts uh, that came, you know, from that. And I'd just like to start with that. And then we will turn it over to Tom. You did actually put that right into our uh, PowerPoint. Tonight. You put your um, diagram. The graphic drove our a, a portion of the upcoming presentation. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to put up now, Coach? Is that what you're asking? No, no, no. I, I just uh, uh, wanted to put it out there that you know we did uh, take the time to look, you know, at that, you know, spent, on, sure. you know. Yeah. You, we found your graph very helpful. So uh, Roy and Kathy have it in there. Um, they did a, they did a uh, slide presentation, um, but I was just going to do an introduction uh, to that report and talk a little bit about the written report that's in the school board's folder. Uh, no, I don't need to put it up. Okay. Great. All right. So um, just for those of you who don't know. Um, I did uh, uh, put a page and a half summary of the state of the district and sort of where we're at, where we started the year, as well as uh, the comments or the concerns that were brought up in the community engagement meeting on the 23rd. And then I also um, put in the section of, you know, my recommendations to the board about how we proceed and how we manage uh, the comments and deal with, uh, I think every one of them. Um, so what I was going to do, is if, if you can't, uh, if you haven't seen that, it's in the folder for tonight on the school board on the school board page of the website. You can access that um, and read the narrative of what we're going to talk about for a few minutes here now. Um, so just the highlights of that report. Um, we've done a lot of stuff. Um, we did quite a bit before that community engagement meeting. And uh, we're still doing a lot now, and we obviously need to do more to try to alleviate the, the stress and strain on the teachers, uh, the community, and, and everyone. I think everyone is feeling that. Um, we've you know, done a, a vaccination mandate. The board supported, supported that. The teachers union supported that. We uh, mandated vaccinations. and. Uh, got an incredible uh, turnout. So we are, are done with that. Everyone here, all of our uh, related um, service contracts, so busing, food service, mental health clinicians um, are all vaccinated, had to comply. All of our staff, teachers, paraprofessionals, custodians, uh, cleaning company are all vaccinated. Um, and there were really very few uh, issues with that mandate. Um, and I think that's made us a lot safer. That's why the board supported it. That's why I supported it. Um, 
people who are vaccinated are generally, you know, six times less apt to carry COVID around and a lot less, 12, 14% times less apt to end up in the hospital with really severe COVID. Um, obviously that hasn't been enough to, to alleviate the stress. And that's why we're gonna talk about um, what came up with the engagement meeting and what we'd like to do at this point. So uh, one of the major concerns on the 23rd was the new Yale curriculum. Um, and how stressful that is on top of everything that the teachers are dealing with. Um, and uh, even though you know we like a lot of the components of it, and we know that it's a strong program, it's not the year to uh, implement a new program like that. So um, I would like uh, to cease the implementation of that program. Um, and that's really the full forward movement of that program as far as a district initiative this year. Um, not because it's bad program, it's a lot of work. It's a program that entails a lot of training. It's a lot of teacher preparation. Um, obviously, we'd like teachers to uh, continue. They need to continue teaching English language arts in the elementary schools, and they can use whatever materials they're they're comfortable using. If they want to use EL on their own accord, they can continue using EL. Um, we'll help them where they need help. Um, but the implementation team uh, will continue meeting and they'll plan for implementation uh, for, you know, after the school year for the next two years. Um, the other thing we'd like to do is um, add more clinics. We feel like the more people that are vaccinated in our community, in our schools, amongst our students, the safer we're all going to be, uh, the less disruptions. The more people that are vaccinated, the less people that are out when there's a quarantine. I think that's a major stressor. Teachers don't know which students are going to be here. Mm -hmm. Principals don't know what teachers are going to be absent. Um, so the vaccination makes it a lot easier. Um, we can also add clinics in the school uh, after school hours. I know during the day it was pretty disruptive. We did that because when the five to 12 vaccination came out, you know, we wanted to get as many people done as quickly as we could. Closing the gym from 12 to three or eight to three and um, is, is, too, is another stressor on a school. So we like to do those after school or the mobile trailers like we did this year at the, at the high school. Um, the volunteers, not exactly sure what we want to do. If we want to go ahead and hire a volunteer coordinator or have volunteer coordinators in each school, we like that idea. We want to pursue it. Um, probably some, some hybrid. Um, right now, Linda Nash, uh, the HR coordinator in my office, handles all the onboarding of, of volunteers. So she's checking their records. Uh, making sure all that paperwork's together. She's got quite a few things to do to make sure that the volunteer is safe to work with the, our students. We have an application, pretty thorough process. Be nice to take that off her plate and have someone who actually does a little bit more as far as, you know, this volunteer wants to work in these schools and they're available for these times or these days and they have these strengths. Um, to try to come up with a much more uh, thorough sort of system and be able to like have principals or teachers say, you know, I'd like you know, a couple of volunteers next Friday because I'm doing this project and I need someone for this, that, and it'd be really neat to have that sort of a, a setup. Um, we also need to do a better job of getting staff feedback. For years, I've held open office hours on Monday afternoon from three to four. And over the years, it's dwindled to, you know, nobody comes. Um, we'd like to do something that's a little more fluid, whether it's the administration going up to the school on a regular basis or listening sessions or, you know, coffee on Friday with Tom, rotated around the district. Um, something like that would be uh, some ways of getting feedback uh, more fluidly with uh, all the staff. Um, one of the, uh, the things I mentioned in, the, in my report was about uh, recruiting staff and the bus company uh, 
has promoted and we've we've done this in the past i like to support um drivers who may want to one of the problems with the recruiting school bus drivers is they work two hours in the morning they work two hours in the afternoon they can pick up trips in between and and different things to to add to those hours but in general that's what the job is they pay fairly well but there's not enough for the average person to be able to support family or or their livelihood um one of the things we used to do quite a bit when i was up in woodstock was have teachers or paraprofessionals have a bus route take their bus you know pick up the students drive to the school work all day in the school get leave a little bit early to get the bus going get and pick up the students and and drive home keep the bus at their house or nearby their house and do the same thing the next day so it makes it for a full day drive and, and you can make quite a bit of extra money if you're a teacher or a paraprofessional um two different companies two different contracts but it works so you'd work two hours before school the whole school day two hours after school you know there are some some complications with that if there's a teacher who's a coach or has after school meetings but mm -hmm. between this if the school and the transportation company work together that works um so that's another idea we'd like to start advertising for that combined position um one of the the uh, smaller things I do, I can do at uh, the district level is eliminate any administrator or school-based work on the two remaining professional development days uh, on January 13th and 14th. Usually we schedule a lot of activities, a lot of different training. Um, I'd like to wipe those days clear and let the teachers do what they need to do. So unscheduled uh, teacher professional development time or planning time. Um, and those are the sort of the big things from my report. And Kathy and Roy, we're going to do a, uh, a PowerPoint to kind of go through what we've done so far and what we want to add with uh, funding, ESSA funding. But I think Peter had a question. Sorry. Not a problem. Uh, just that when I was reviewing the comments from the community engagement session we had last time, one of the issues that came up was a concern that volunteering would result in the person who was volunteering having to pay for the background check and so forth. Can you address that? Yeah, no, we don't, we don't do that anymore. We've been paying for the background checks. Um, they do need to be done. That's one of the barriers sometimes with the you know, volunteers if they have to do the full background check. Um, I knew that was the answer. I just wanted you to get it and say it for everybody else to hear. Yeah. <laughs> and we have we have them paying for it. They also need to be vaccinated. Yes. So all of our volunteers are fully vaccinated. They have the same proof that everyone else has to show us. So, and I think everyone's complied. So. Thank you for asking that. Thanks, Peter. Anything else before Roy and Kathy launch into the, the details a little more? I have a couple of questions on the volunteer section. May I? Sure. Before, before I turn it back to you. <laughs> no, go ahead, Nancy. I know Coach and I had a very long conversation because I had a lot of a lot of concerns about the volunteers coming in and um, and and he um, again he and I had a very long conversation about it and I appreciate the time that he took with me to be able to do it but some of my concerns that I have about parents coming in as volunteers is first are they going to be CPR first day trained now you've talked about the background checks you've talked about the fingerprints um what happens when they are in a classroom? Now, understand, I understand that the teachers are the people that are responsible for that classroom. But if you've got 15 kids in that classroom and you've only got one teacher, and now you're pulling in a volunteer who is not trained to work with children. So what do they know about working with the special needs kids, the ADHDs, the Asperger's, the ODDs, the ones with behavioral disorders, the ones with cognitive delays, any other social emotional delays and any other learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. The teachers cannot talk to these parents coming in 
about those children because that's a confidentiality. Mm -hmm. That's a legal mm -hmm. issue there. So mm -hmm. I'm, con I'm concerned about how that's going to work. Well, the, vo the volunteers are not brought in in the way that's uh, just carte blanche. They're oh, I understand yeah, that too. They're brought in in specific ways for something the teacher or the administrator wants help with. So that is a very big limitation in the volunteer. Right. They're not coming in to replace staff. Oh, I know. I understand yeah, that. They're so, coming in to, to aid right, the staff, right. to be so there to help huge them. huge limitation of confidentiality. You know, exactly. Like children in the school, and they're like, oh, that's so-and-so's kid. Look at the way he, she, but he. Yes. Yes. Huge concern. It, that's fact, a big concern for me. brought that up as we talk so much about volunteering in the schools on the 23rd. Many of the, the principals voice you know, significant concerns to me later. Like, you know, volunteers are good, but they have their limitation. Exactly. They they can't deal with the behaviors, which is one of the areas we're having the most trouble with. Right. They can't deal with just, you know, the, the absence of other staff. It's not a it's not a one-on-one -on -one correlation, but they can take the edge off for can you run an activity with 15 kids in the gym while I try to plan this activity for the, you know, the teacher tries to point. And we have to be very strategic in how you use the volunteer. So it might be an activity where there's two or three teachers and yes, we want another set of hands or two, mm -hmm. those kind of things. So that the supplemental, obviously there's range. They don't have CPR training unless they just happen to have it. So no. And that's a concern for me too. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only for if something happens to a child, but if a teacher kills over in the middle of the classroom in a heart attack. Hmm. Right. You know, I would hope that they would, some of my other so concerns that, are the consistency in the class. the answer to everything. I, oh, I know, <laughs> I know. I just yeah. want to bring up some of the concerns yeah. that I have as a member of the school board and a member of the community. Uh, the consistency in the classroom. So you're talking about, oh, I need a class, you said, the teacher could come to the principal and say, oh, I'm going to need somebody to come and help me with a project on Friday. So, but I was thinking that the teachers are saying that if I need help, then I need help every Monday because I know that this particular child is going to be in my classroom and it's always a very difficult situation. So is that volunteer going to be the same volunteer every single Monday? I mean, every, sing every single Monday, for instance, so that the children... I mean, they're already in a, anyway, especially the younger ones. See, and that's what I think the volunteer coordinator comes into to play, because there's going to be people who are like, you know, the range of volunteering is going to be, for, yeah, it can do, you know, one day a month or Absolutely. for a specific acti activity a couple times a year to, yeah, I'd like to come every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 8 to 12. Right. So you have that range and it would be nice for someone to be sort of coordinating that say, okay, so you need a volunteer for that much time. Is it appropriate? Mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable use of a volunteer and who's available? You it, know, so that, that's the piece that would be really nice of having sort of a volunteer. Right. And then having the volunteer in there is how much time is that going to take away from the teacher actually doing her job mm -hmm. or his job? Right. Because now they've got to, this is how we do this. and. And then, and I'm well, not saying, I'm not trying to be mean or yeah. ugly, no, but they're going to be though, that, people that are coming in and can't do it. do it. No, this, the volunteers aren't going to replace staff. Oh, I understand so that. So staff need, we're going to be very clear what there's a need for additional staff. I understand. Whether there's a volunteer who's supplemental, they're temporary, they're not trained, they're, they're you know, an extra set of eyes, an extra set of hands, obviously a range of volunteers if some are more capable um, some want to, you know, prepare materials for a teacher. So yeah, I, I understand all of that. I really do. I just, I'm going to play the devil's advocate on this all the way. I just, if we're going to do this program, if we're going to go ahead and get, if we're going to do it, then I think we need to look at all of the situations. And these are some valid situations. These have come up. Maybe not in our school, but at my daycare when we were having volunteers come in. Or I, I know better than I know better than half, half us just the teacher, but I know because 
I'm older and I've already raised my kids and it happens. And I just want us to be sure that we're going to cover every single eventuality that could happen. Right. And I think that's exactly why the principals had so many concerns. Not because they don't want the volunteers. Exactly. To do it right. Exactly. You don't exactly. Want it to be another burden on that's the right. teacher. Yeah, I don't want it to be a band aid. No, or on the administrator. So right. Exactly. If we're going to put all that time in, we yeah. need to have it done. Right. Correctly. And right. I don't think that's going to be able to happen in two weeks' time. No. Well, but we do have, sorry to interrupt. I'm no, just, no. I just, we do have volunteers there now. We're right. just not having anybody coordinating them now. Right? Isn't that well, how much, how much, how school? many volunteers are in our schools? That's now? a great question. Yeah. Do you know? I yeah, Walker? I don't know off the top of my head. We have quite a uh, contingent of volunteers. Oh. And what do they do? The they, um, they do everything. All sorts of things that, like we just talked about, from mm -hmm. assisting the teacher in the classroom with whatever they need, prepping materials, covering various activities, obviously field trips, playing games with with students. We have Dartmouth volunteers. Read with um, kids. They read with kids. They with help students. transition them from the classroom to their related arts. Or I was just in one of the schools today, and I saw a volunteer. Taking a you know a class from their classroom down to the to lunch. Mm -hmm. you know? So I mean, very. You said varied. Uh, I saw varied. someone running running copies off in the office for a teacher. So. So I'm hearing that a volunteer comes into Dothan Brook, and they report into the office, and I'm here to volunteer, and their names on the list, and they've got all the things that we require for them to do. So they just. I'm, I'm asking because I don't know. So do they just sit there and tell one of the teachers calls down and says, no, no. Hey, no. I need somebody to come up here and no. walk my kids no. down no. to the lunchroom. I mean, that's where the work comes in. Yeah, no, it's the needs more, already. Yeah, the needs addressed. already established. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so these people have said they'll volunteer. Mrs. Russell, um, Mrs. Smith needs a volunteer. Can you come yeah. in and help her on Friday because she's, you know, cutting yeah. out turkeys for the, uh, Thanksgiving right. we, display. Yeah. We or, had, used to have a volunteer that came in to help shelf books or help the librarian put the covers on the books. And she right. would come in on certain days because that was the need of the librarian. So um, yeah. Yeah. I can it certainly- It's a tremendous yeah. amount of work yep. though, making sure that you don't do anything inappropriate mm -hmm. or, yep. you know. Or I'm thinking about the cleaning crew because we're having problems with the cleaning crew now. With they wouldn't even have to take off work. <laughs> exactly. No, a lot of schools are using volunteers to do that contact surface. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, right. that contact surface cleaning mm -hmm. has proved to not be as necessary as we thought last year. Right. But that's still a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Teachers are being asked to, you know, then they want to clean the classrooms in, in between. Right. The kids. That's a perfect role if a volunteer wants to do that. Yeah. And, then, and they're serving a huge need for us. And that's also a stressor for a teacher. Exactly. Like, exactly. oh my goodness, I got to run to the bathroom, get something to drink, clean off the desk because I got a different group in, or just yeah. that's their comfort level. Right. I want to clean off the desk. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Right. You know, so it's huge. Okay. But I just want to. That's part of the role is like when and where is a volunteer appropriate? And is there someone that can do that? Right. You know? mm -hmm. Again, I just, I know I'm playing devil's advocate on this, oh, but I no, really I just. Think that's part you know, of it. That's, that's fine. And, we, yeah. and Coach and I talked about that a, a lot the other night, too. But. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I think, you know, we're aware of all those things, and that's part of the challenge is in, a, in the situation we're in, we don't want to ask the teacher to do more to just to organize exactly to, we don't want to ask the principal to do more exactly right? so having someone who can sort of navigate all of that and say is this a job for a volunteer or should this be a paid position is this you know is there someone available to do that and who that's what you know if we did a like, volunteer coordinator or a group of volunteer coordinators that's sort of what they would do. So that brings up another question. question yeah, but <laughs> that brings up another question then if we get the coordinators and do I remember right that there was going to be one coordinator for each school? 
Yeah, we haven't gone that far. <laughs> okay, I'm just thinking, <laughs> we haven't gone where that is that yet. money going to come from? There's some difference of opinion as to what would be most helpful. Right. Right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because if it comes from ESSER funds, that's one thing, but that's not sustainability. Well, there's a couple different needs. Like the, at the district level, the volunteer coordinator would be sort of onboarding. It's a little bit of this is in my report, but mm -hmm. onboarding, which is like filling out the application. Where do you want to go? What do you think you could do to help? Um, do you have the record check? You know, you got to get your fingerprints done. All of that sort of, mm -hmm. it's almost like hiring someone. Yeah. No mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, talking with the volunteer coordinator at the district level would we talk with the principals of the school that they want to volunteer in and say, yeah, Mrs. Russell would like to volunteer mm -hmm. at White River School or White River School or Middle School. You usually have an idea, mm -hmm. you have a connection to one of the schools. Right, right. So there. These are the things I wouldn't mind doing. Or we might even have someone create a list of jobs for volunteers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you mentioned for cleaning, yeah. all duty, right. conditioning, students. <laughs> Show books, cleaning Cutting. materials, you know, <laughs> toys that you remember from. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> toys need to be cleaned all the time. Right. Um, playground, you know, all the right. supervision. And again, it's not in place of a teacher. The teacher's still there. But sure. It's nice to yeah. have four people mm -hmm. instead of two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those extra set of eyeballs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> cafeteria. Every time I, I go to the school, I look at the cafeteria at lunchtime and it's like, I, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> You know, got 20 kids in line and they all want something different. And somebody's upset and somebody's milk spilled and somebody else is getting just a whatever. Oh, yeah. Those, you know, having people there to help them see another, hopefully, a reduction in stress. Tom, can I ask who manages that now? Is that on the administrators? Is that on the building principals? Yeah, and there so, aren't that many of them. And, and so <laughs> it would actually take workload off of our administrators mm -hmm. to have this position. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. Yeah. yeah. We want to make sure exactly. that, that we don't want it to add to. Right. Yeah. To make it better for, yeah. right. And, and Linda Nash, who's retiring mm -hmm. at the end of March, yeah. includes all of this onboarding in her role. So, any right. volunteer, she's got to make sure they have their record checks, make sure she's done the record checks. There's three different checks. Make sure they have an appointment for their fingerprints. Um, vaccination now. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Coach, can I say something quickly? Sure. It seems to me the way to proceed with this would be to come up with a plan in a budget, that way we could address some of Nancy, ensure some of Nancy's concerns are addressed and understand what the procedure is type thing. Because for me, the volunteer coordinator of school should report to the principal to get approval, just because that person's gonna be ultimately responsible. Then up to the district coordinator type thing. Yeah. Cause there's merit to having somebody in the school who knows the school right. Mm -hmm. right. to do it but we need to see a budget and, and understand what roles are being played type yeah. thing because yeah. we want to do it right as desperate sure as the helpful. need is right. we want to make sure it's helpful and the volunteers are helpful yeah. and none of it is more of a burden than that's right it is not on anybody right. exactly that that's why the discussion yeah, yeah. So, if we may, um, Roy, you have the calm, and Ken. Okay, Coach. Um, here's the uh, the graphic that uh, Coach had mentioned uh, to start start this portion of the meeting. Um, he broke down, um, basically categorized all of the comments that that we gathered from the uh, Tuesday night community engagement. Um, then what Kathy and I did for this for this portion is to do a lot of what Tom talked about in terms of how are we responding to these these concerns or needs, but also putting in what we had in place that were to combat these issues prior to that meeting, because sometimes people don't realize the issue may still exist in this moment, but we have put something into place. It just hasn't 
come to fruition yet mm -hmm. and and made the made the uh, positive impact we hoped for and as always what we're trying to do throughout this you'll see we, we we talk about how we fund it so that you can say is it a local fund is it title funds or is it ESSER mm -hmm. funds so that um as the community gets more and more used to seeing how how these new positions are appearing it can get stressful if you're wondering who's paying for that and, how, and how's it being covered so that they understand how it's being funded at every turn. Um, so um, the first the first set of uh, concerns were around COVID supports, which were around vaccination, testing, and the pro safety protocols. Um, things we have in place to, to meet this, to Tom mentioned the vaccination mandate, hosting vaccination sites, um, we're um, talking about sending the updates to families. Um, the, uh, the test kits, it's not a test to stay kit. It's, it's actually, that's a, that's a modified, it's a take home, it's a take -home <laughs> test. Um, what came from the meeting is um, items like Tom has reviewed and refined the guidance for our winter activities, um, additional vaccination clinics and pursuing the option for staff and students to test on-site and at area vaccination clinics. Yeah, we continue to work that just this week, I sent out a list of area um, mm -hmm. clinics and doctor physicians offices and hospitals and uh, pharmacies that will do the <laughs> testing for free. We're still working on that. Um, we're, you know, we're hoping to secure some tests and make it as easy as possible for folks to get tested here. Um, I know that Visbit is considering, I just got a notice today, um, supplying all of the members of the um, insurance trust with uh, complimentary uh, test kits. So that would be super helpful. That'd be great. Uh, you know, where they mail them to you, and I think it was about mm -hmm. 10. So they haven't decided if they're going to do that. So we probably could put some pressure on them if that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of free options for testing. So people shouldn't be paying for it for tests. I know it's more convenient, but there are a lot of free clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, mental health supports due to COVID. Um, we continue to offer EAP, which is, we, we did tell you what this, what this acronym was. It's Employment Assistance <laughs> Program. We tried um, in this one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, our staff just needs to contact Linda Nash and, and they're able to set up appointments. Um, mental health clinicians that at least we have at least one per building right now. Uh, we're utilizing panorama surveys, which we shared with you all tonight. In terms of that's that's one of the ways that they can write down. You can have building-based data, but you can also refine it all the way down to an individual student. So that gives them some capacity to depend on how they want to look at it. And we have a clinical director. Um, two positions that we're adding because of uh, some of the information we've gotten back, we're adding another uh, full FTE mental health clinician and an additional uh, student assistance program counselor. Uh, one of the topics that was on, uh, on Coach's graphic that, that we, we're reviewing, but we don't have any uh, responses to at this moment was reviewing the districting. Um, so that will impact future planning, but we don't have anything for you at this moment. Um, EL, that, that was a major component of the conversation at the uh, community engagement. Things we have in place, um, we provided materials, uh, professional development contract. So we um, are providing that for folks. Uh, we've been giving people the ability to go at their own pace. Uh, providing release time within the school day for planning and collaboration, and um, the implement implementation team with the EL coaches and the curriculum director. Um, moving forward, Tom mentioned that now we're going to cease the, di the district implementation plan and that um, the teachers are going to be using the materials that they're most comfortable with and how they want to proceed. Um, funding sources for, for this. Oh, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. Implementation team is going to do what? They're going to just continue to plan for the future. So they're they're not the, the team itself is not disbanding, but it'll give the team uh, a really a nice time to be able to 
plan more purposeful for the future, basically. And in terms of the material costs, I think that that did come up in the meeting is that the, the materials purchased through the ESSER funds. So that, that's up there for you folks. Um, volunteers, which we covered. Um, and if we were to look at a coordinating position, we would be looking at ESSER funds, at least for the now now. And the nice thing with that is it gives you a chance to uh, to try it too. So if we do as the best we can to sort of develop it, and if we decide to do a position, we try it with us or grant funding, and we sort of evaluate whether we like the way it's working or or not. Yeah. If it's more of a burden or problematic in any way, mm -hmm. nothing ventured, nothing doing sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, around uh, providing more opportunities for teachers to be heard. Tom was just talking about moving beyond his open office hours and trying to explore different ways to, to hear the staff, um, maybe in the building level where they don't have to come to him, he's going to them. Um, and we mentioned that in January, we we're going to be offering the Panorama staff survey. Um, the uh, concept of the, the teacher burnout being caused by student behaviors, class size, and lack of substitutes. Um, some items that we have in place is we have behavioral interventionists. We have five of them in the buildings. Um, we have behavioral supports. Um, schools are using PBIS, restorative practices. They have a practice coach. Um, they have a collaborative problem solving trainer. Um, we have an extended learning coach. Uh, we have an additional pre-K teacher. Uh, we have an equity coordinator, kindergarten behavior parent educator, kindergarten interventionist, and an instructional and instructional interventionist. From the meeting, things we're going to be looking at adding additional behavioral interventionists, uh, receiving and processing substitute applicants. Uh, the elimination of all district directed trainings on in-service days that will increase teacher directed time during these days to allow for more planning and things that, that they feel will help them prepare for the next time. And, it looks like you want to yeah, I did want to add something. Um, the additional kindergarten interventionist and paraeducator, uh, um, that is a recent ad and it just, that happened just sort of probably a couple of weeks before the community engagement meeting. And since, well, maybe maybe three, I'm not sure how many weeks, but it's pretty recent because right. weeks are going like by, <laughs> like, I can't keep track of time. So scratch that. Anyway, it's pretty no, it recent, right? Recent. It's yeah. pretty, yeah. Um, three weeks. Right. And, and as I um, actually just got some data from the uh, one of the most impacted schools in terms of the behavior, which you've heard about, right? Um, and the data is actually showing that this is making a difference. And what was reported was that um, in looking at the Swiss data, the behavior um, referrals and the number of aggressive behaviors have decreased about 50%. Wow. So that's, that's really good that's news. Good. Yeah. Um, Still more work to be done. As you can see, we're still adding more. Uh, it's not enough, but it is making it an impact. So that's that's nice to know. It's nice to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice to know that it's something that we try is actually having an impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And funding sources, you can notice up there that it's it's a combination of all all of our sources, the local, the title, and the S funds. Yes. Um, the parents. Yeah. Burnout around COVID, having a voice, the busing concerns in childcare, um, the things that we have in place, we're reducing the impact of quarantine for vaccinated students, regular communication around the COVID cases, and utilizing community engagement meetings. Uh, items we're adding, we mentioned that the family survey for Panorama will be going out in January. Uh, we're exploring partnerships for extended learning opportunities. This will possibly in the summer and after school programming and childcare. Uh, looking to recruit combined positions for the driver that Tom explained in terms of how we might be able to get more bus drivers. And um, also the 
the notion that trying to rotate the drivers so that the same bus isn't light every single time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and that's local and ESSER funds. Uh, just a, this is kind of a preview to coming attractions. Um, <laughs> future community engagement meetings, which we're running through through the school board, but also that um, Kathy and I will be sending out announcements around running a town hall. So the goals this spring will be to share um, results from some of the ESSER one and two, because we're starting to get some results and you would see that what our investments are, but also the, um, the, the ESSER three, which is just short of two and a half million mm -hmm. um, is what our anticipated number is. And we'll be uh, sharing, sharing what we have planned and some actions that we hope to do, but also getting some feedback and needs from the community where they think that, that there's some opportunities so that they can have some impact into future planning. So um, not only through the community engagement, but um, for them to keep their eyes out, we'll be sending through Messenger, our town halls have been uh, a great way to, to get this, the, the public voice. So uh, we look forward to more. And that's it for okay. us. Any comments, questions? Peter, go ahead. Uh, I, yeah. So- um, Peter, go ahead. I'm sorry. Having um, a, a head full of Swiss cheese and the, uh, I occasionally have to go look up things I ought to know or should be able to remember. And one of those was, what in the world is an ESSER fund? So I went and Googled it uh, for the education of others who may be similarly afflicted. ESSER stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, and evidently there was something like $122 billion worth of ESSER funds authorized mm. recently. Uh, that said, it appears that the ESSER funds are a grant that you have to apply for. Uh, so I'm interested in knowing what the likelihood of receiving an ESSER fund is uh, if you make the application uh, and what we do if we don't receive the funds we are hoping to receive. And the other question that is really sort of uh, the documents I looked at showed ESSER funds being granted through 2022. Uh, the implication being that at that point, once those funds are obligated, they will be available for the, the rest of that year, but no more. So what do we do to transition to a period of time post ESSER? I can answer those questions. So I think Wonderful. The first question is, that you had was the application process and do we get it or what happens if we don't get it? We get it. There's no question. You apply for it, you get it. We apply for it. It's pretty simple. They want it, you know, the money's there. They want to give it to us. So it's a much easier process than any other grant that we have ever applied for. It, you know, there are requirements and certain things that we have to do in order to apply, but once we put that application in, you are granted that money. Um, ESSER 1 and 2 have already been granted to us. We are, have access to those funds. We've pretty much spent all of ESSER 1, and we're working on pretty much spending all of ESSER 2, but we still have the ability to amend in ESSER 2, and there is no limit to the number of times you can make amendments and change your funding around within the grant, which is again, unlike any other grant that we have ever applied for. And ESSER 3, um, we do not have those funds yet. In fact, we have not, we don't even have the application for it. The AOE, the feds haven't even given the AOE the actual application yet. We do have some preliminary things that we can be doing, and one of them is um, community engagement. So we're ahead of that, you know, like so that when we actually get the application, we're ready to go because we've had the the um, engagement. So we're currently documenting uh, tonight, for example, what we did tonight will go in the documentation that we have, you know, provided uh, some. Uh, community awareness around the way we're spending funding and what our needs are. 
Uh, and the other question was future post. Oh, future. Oh, the, future. the years. Yes. So the, you're you're right in that 2022 mm -hmm. for ESSER two. Okay. We still haven't gotten ESSER three, and that goes beyond mm -hmm. that time period. So that's I another. I think it's 25. There's three years yeah. to that mm -hmm. one. Yeah. So. That's a good point. I mean, we have a little bit longer than what you indicated, but in any case, there is an end point. So all along the way, we should be thinking about and evaluating the programs that we're putting in place to see how uh, and if we want to keep some of these in place, what, how will you do that? Mm -hmm. Are they effective? Are they not effective? What do you want to continue to do? What don't you want to continue to do? Thank you very much for that explanation, clarification. One of the things you always want to keep in mind is that when this funding dries up, you know, this is a long couple of years from now because of the way the federal government has, has staged this. You don't want to have a funding cliff and say, oh, all these things are great and they're wonderful and they really worked, but how is the school district now going to afford three and a half million dollars of extra expense? So we have to be very strategic with right. trying things, assessing them, evaluating, is this working? Should we continue it? How do we fit that in? Yeah. But the other, the other idea, I mean, that we'll get into as we do these engagement meetings around this topic is um, things like building out the Christian street property. If the board and the community really want to engage in that for sort of an outdoor learning center for, for the future generations in Hartford, of students in Hartford, you could use ESSER money and that would be great because it's a one-time expense. There's no cliff <laughs> with that. Right. Other than maintenance, you know, there's a little maintenance right. that we do there, but I mean, we're thinking, you know, maybe perhaps, you know, water, it's, sewer, um, yeah. that sort and of are, are the various regional programs we are sponsors for or hosts to able to take advantage of this well? as well, and if so, have they? Um, other schools would Take get I was thinking of, you know, the Wilder School programs, uh, you know, the, the RAC, the RAP, et cetera, the various different, uh, you know, the vocational school, quite frankly, which is multi-school district and multi-state. They um, actually have yeah. their own money. They have their own right. money. Okay. Yeah. It's a separate grant. Of separate mm -hmm. grants. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. When well, you sure. were talking about the um, EAP, EAP appointments, it seems like every time when I look, when Linda's posting something, Linda Nash is posting something that she'll say, mm -hmm. like, she's got one appointment left, or, and I'm thinking, do we need more appointment times or do we have teachers or staff that can't get an appointment because it's already full? Well, that's, I'm not quite sure how that all works. No, that's a great point because that's exactly what we're gauging. This, this, that invite for the next time the council will be here has been out for a while. What she's saying is this, so many slots have been taken. Right. There's a couple left. Right. So they're sort of the end of the line. If, if she had an info said, you know, Tom, there's six people who want appointments and they're full. I would say get another council. That's my question because I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. she, right. She did a really nice job. Right. She, she does. See, yeah. see, I guess I guess to uh, to help facilitate the, the response to that question as well, uh, because I think we all, you know, see those memos. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing is there's a reason they exist, and that is because of the thoroughness of our HR director, who happens to be Linda. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the other piece to that puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, so in the search and the quest uh, to finding her uh, ultimate replacement is going to be to try to figure out a way to clone her. <laughs> uh, and, and and i know that uh you know roy and kathy and tom have been doing some science experiments so hopefully <laughs> there's actually a couple people that are in the 
for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ned. So, so I guess I guess we're at the um, uh, Jim and Jacob um, the draft two. All right. So before we take off here, um, I just want to point out that in the Google folder for this week, uh, we have the internal controls checklist, uh, which we're required to fill out every year. Um, so Jake, are you uh, going to put that up or do you want Roy to? Uh, Roy, could you get that? Financial, yep. financial controls. Internal. The one that's sideways, you don't have to straighten it out. Yes. It's in the, uh, it's in the scoreboard folder. Jacob, you want to start? I'll, uh, I'll go and pick, pull it up. Okay. So I'm not going to go through this line by line because it hasn't changed. Uh, the only thing that I'm going to point out, because uh, it's a no on here, is uh, our checks always written out to a specified payees and not to cash, and we put no. And the only reason for that is uh, with schools petty cash, uh, the checks themselves have to be written out to cash. This is something that Mascoma Bank has said, hey, we won't cash this unless it's made out to cash. So that is the only exception to checks. Otherwise, they're made out to a specific payee. And each one of those is documented. Correct. Uh, sorry, Jacob. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> No worries. You see me trying to rotate it? <laughs> Sorry. I apologize for the delay, folks. No. While we're doing this, I have a question for Jacob and well, I guess, Jim, you're really not concerned with this much longer. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, but um, when you put together the budget documents because of the uh, money that we're getting as emergency relief for COVID, would it be possible to make sure that that is highlighted so we keep in the back of our mind as we go over this in future budgets, oh, what percentage of the budgets are actually related to those funds. Sure. Thank you very much. And, and, and that's, Peter, that, that's very helpful. Peter, I, I just want to say right now, what what's in your budget that you've got is kind of like the traditional uh, monies that we receive, the IDAs, the the, the tech center grants and, and the normal Title I, Title II. Uh, so it's a $1.7 million worth of grants, not the, not the additional you know, $2 million of, of uh, COVID money. <laughs> yeah, I just would like to make sure that this school board and future school boards sort of keep that in the back of their mind that this is something that will like Cinderella's coach turn into a pumpkin at some point. <laughs> yes, yes. Steve, did you have more to say on the uh, financial controls document? Uh, no, so if there's any questions, uh, certainly feel free to ask, but I will need a volunteer from the board to sign off on this. And I have a fillable PDF that I'll send you. Um, so if anyone would like to volunteer. I will. I'll... Okay. Oh, if you can, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. If anyone in the public wants to see all that that entails, it is in the uh, folder for tonight's meeting. 
or financial control. Something we do every year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's fine, Russ. Jake, I don't know if you want Roy to manage the, the uh, slide on. The I'll say I have the uh, the budget ready to go. If I can right. share the screen. See if you have the permission to share the screen. And if not, we'll go. All right. Yeah. So this is uh, the sheet that you saw last time for draft one. Uh, this is just the major changes uh, for next fiscal year's budget. Um, and I'll just point out the only real changes here. Uh, we did get the health in and that's coming at 5% increase instead of 10%. Um, which is going to be, you know, 325,778 increase. Um, and then the only other changes uh, worth adding a assistant principal at the middle school. And then uh, while the transportation contract is still ongoing, uh, we've put a $200,000 figure in there now, uh, just while we're trying to work out the next contract. And then obviously we have, you know, $439,000 uh, in there right now uh, towards specific repairs being that uh, this year uh, we delayed a lot of the repairs because things looked much bleaker. So that was one area where we cut back on for this year's budget. Yeah, and we felt that so we really want to re reinstate that chunk of money. Um, so overall right now, uh, we're looking at a $1.9 million increase. Um, and then the next two sheets are just the function summary and then the object summary. So a uh, little bit more breakdown of the budget. Um, if there's any questions there. And then um, on the fourth sheet or the fifth page, excuse me. Um, just an early projection of the revenues uh, and expenses for all funds. Uh, obviously, we're you know still early on here in December for the budget, and we're waiting on uh, more yields, data, and uh, final budget stuff to come in. Obviously, with the tech center and the collabs, uh, those are always tricky. Um, and then once we get to the tax page here. Um, We've started to get some projections on the yields. The yields are not final as of yet, um, but I will say the changes here, uh, we assumed a 5% decrease on the CLA, which is the common level of appraisal. Uh, we're supposed to get that figure at the end of the month, but the way things run, uh, who knows? <laughs> But for right now, we've assuming a 5% decrease just because it's a wild west market for houses and who knows where that's going to go. Um, and then as we go further down here on line 12, because um, the, the letter that was sent out basically gave two scenarios. Scenario A, which is, you know, hey, you're gonna have access to this surplus money and the yields and everything are gonna go up and look great. Or B, uh, which is the more conservative approach, which is what the AOE is suggesting we go with right now, which is you're not gonna have any access to that money because everybody wants a piece of the pie. Um, so with those yields, um, these are the way things are. Um, 0.8% decrease on the tax rate and 9.5% uh, decrease on the income. Still early on, no final projections as of yet, but 
um, that's where we are right now. And um, I know we're going to talk about uh, fund balances and reserve accounts in much more detail later on, but all this assumes that we're putting a million dollars to offset taxes for next fiscal year. So. Understanding your conservatism in the CLA, I think it's gonna go down even more. For giggles, I looked at my house on Zillow and its assessment, and right now I'm at 70% of its assessed value for my taxes. Wow. So, so I amplify what you're saying, and I understand why you use 5%, but I think we've got to be prepared for even a worse shock. Well, remember that Zillow is also the company that managed to lose billions of dollars trying to do house flipping. So. I know that, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> let's, say, let's, let's say it's 80%, because yeah. they also didn't include my other parcel in the Zillow, Zillow estimate, too. So I right. understand. Uh, did the the budget materials you're showing us get into the packet for this meeting? I didn't think I saw them. Yeah, I, was saying, I don't know if it was sent out, but it's in the Google folder. Yeah, okay, because I didn't Google see it there. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sorry if I didn't put it in Did the material yeah. sent out. Some no, I didn't get that. But they. Did I, I didn't see. It. Yeah, I, I didn't see it in the, the Google folders. Yeah, FY23 budget draft and then financial. Oh, okay. Let's see. You can hear it. Oh, thank you. Similar, uh, to, similar to our hybrid meeting. Okay. Got it. Okay, thank you. Zipped right past it when I was looking for it. A lot of documents in there tonight. Mm, yep. Any questions on the budget so far? Um, I know we're early on in the process, but when does the equalized pupils number come out? It should be mid mid December. It's quite possibly that's going to go up. We yeah. hope. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. Um, I'm sure we'll get a lot more updates and stuff because we have a VASBO meeting this Friday, which is the Vermont Association of School Business Officials. So I'm sure we'll be getting some updates, hopefully, from the state then. You know, I, I want to see this looks, at least at this time, this looks pretty good in that with all of the uh, additional, you know, requirements for the 23 budget, we're not looking too bad as far as the tax rate right now. That said, to be honest about it, the tax rate could go down. <laughs> Maybe because the value of your house has gone up, you're going to have a problem still. <laughs> yep. 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 Yeah. But. So, as usual with our budget at this time of the year, we are going to play sort of, you know, monitor it and try to see where we should be and how much you want to add to the budget or subtract or move or this is different than most of us. Usually, we're seeing something very the opposite, very high. Yeah. Yeah, uh, at this time, and we're trying to adjust, and then it flips over and it's low. Yeah, we don't know. Well, Jim, I bet you feel good about not having to guess what the state's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute wild card: what the state is going to do, and and I hope they do it right, whatever they do. <laughs> yeah. But I do think it puts more pressure on the board when the numbers are like this to identify what you want to do with um, fund balance from last year. Just an opportunity. Yep. And I know the finance committee is considering it. Exactly. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so, so Tom, do you have um, sure. your? I'm hoping uh, pull up uh, district facilities plan committee draft in that same fold. Just, um, I don't know if you, um, Coach or Russ, want to say anything about our, our finance committee discussion when they launch into um, the maintenance and improvement committee. Um, Peter, you know, if you choose to it at the moment. Uh, I'm sorry, what are you asking me? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, not Peter. I mean, Russ. I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh. <laughs> I was impressed that Peter was at the meeting too. Was like, no, I, <laughs> uh, I think because, I mean, we discussed like the million dollar buy down of using part of the surplus to do that. And coming up in the next, probably at the next meeting, we're also going to possibly because we lend very favorably towards it, propose that some of the surplus be put aside for capital maintenance, specifically the roofs or roof type thing. Because we're in a fortunate position right now. Perfect. So what I put together, the board has discussed a, uh, um, based on the success of the Wilder Building Study Committee, um, that was able to secure or help the community pass a bond um, for the Wilder School renovation after two two failed attempts. Uh, and we got a lot of comments, positive comments that that committee worked well. So um, one of the things the board discussed uh, in a few few meetings ago was the idea of a district building. Um, you see, I want to make sure I call it the right, right for a future, another future acronym. We're going to be careful. <laughs> District Facilities <laughs> Planning Committee. Correct. EFPC. <laughs> Correct. Um, a, new, a new acronym. Yeah, new, new acronym. Um, that would just model off of the, what we did for the Wilder School, but uh, a new twist of looking at all of the school district uh, property buildings and grounds or real estate. Um, so the, uh, the, the six large schools, um, seven if you count Wilder, um, and the uh, Christian Street property. And then we also have a number of maintenance and office buildings, which all require some sort of uh, maintenance and improvements and, and adjustments for you know new programs, new curriculum, uh, various needs. Um, and we have a lot of ideas and we really need some sort of subcommittee or uh, group of, of interested citizens and school board members and, and school uh, personnel to, to, to work together. So study what we have, what we need, what we want to do. I think the decisions we make now are going to affect the future populations for a long time. Um, so my proposal was to, uh, to form a committee. You can see the document there. It consists of seven, seven voting members, at least one of which is a Hartford School Board member, uh, three which of uh, the members could be from the public. One of those would have professional design acquisition experience. Um, one uh, school teacher or staff member one, uh, the facilities director would just be uh, prudent to have on there and, and myself or a designee. Um, actually, all three community members should have some sort of um, professional design acquisition experience or some sort of experience with, um, with buildings. And then I, I uh, just tried to outline some draft uh, goals for this, for this committee review the existing needs of the district and all materials in support of current project planning and pending bond renovation efforts. What started this was, you know, we have plans for the best room, we have plans for a uh, sort of a renovation at the middle school, light ceilings, doors, sort of an interior upgrade. 
we have plans for a, a high school renovation of the H lobby and the library and um, uh, a fab lab, which is uh, something geared towards the new curriculum that's much more hands-on, that's really taken off at the high school. Um, we need some bathroom upgrades in both of those buildings. We have the roofs at Aquichi and Dothenbrook that have been on the docket for a long time. Uh, we have the Christian Street property that we've discussed. Um, so those are all sort of part of one, as well as the couple house um, that we purchased a few years ago that the board and community agreed to purchase. Tom? Uh, a lot of things in the pipeline. Uh, Tom, Peter, Peter had a question. I just, I, I'm supportive of this, but uh, since time travel hasn't been invented, invented yet, you might want to change the due date. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, would, that would be very ambitious. <laughs> mm. I can change that right now. I don't know what the date should be. Yes, it, uh, that's that's a good question when it should be, but we probably can't make that date. Yeah, we, can't, we can't do that one. I'm sorry. Oh, all right. So, Tom, the other... I never to re reinvent the wheel. Yeah, the, I know. And I give you credit. Piece, the other piece of this um, for the board... Uh, if we're going to have this committee, uh, I think that it would be helpful uh, if they were also charged with uh, reviewing and uh, helping us prepare the draft of the 25 year uh, and subsequent uh, uh, maintenance plans. Um, you know, since you know, all of these things are included within that. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I definitely and, thought it would be a sort of a conduit too for uh, Jonathan Garthway, the new director of mm -hmm. Ground and Safety, to um, mm -hmm. review and, you know, work with this team to sort of review that maintenance plan and his ideas. Right. Part Since, of what I wanted him. Right. Um, Since it is the board's, you know, like, responsibility we have one in place uh it's been adjusted uh over the last 11 years uh and um you know one of the suggestions that came you know up during our just discussion of facilities in general you know was the fact that you know we do have the 25 year plan but there are incremental stages uh that would have different review processes. So, you know, there might be the five-year, uh, the annual uh, plan uh, that we would be uh, looking for uh, base funds um, and in some cases, one-time funds. So, uh, you know, I, it, I think when, when you, I, th I thought you had mentioned that before when you were, were outlining it, uh, you know, prior to this point. But, you know, it's just a little minor edit. No, I would definitely add that in there specifically. Cool. So uh, cool. just yeah. quickly going through. So yeah. what at least I'm thinking, and again, just like Kevin just did, please chime yeah. in, comment, add. Additionally, uh, yeah. I could foresee the need to actually engage consulting engineers or something like that. Would we want to uh, have that as uh, something they are uh, that the committee is authorized to do, or should they come back to the board, or how would uh, you want to deal with that? I, I would suggest that they come back to the board, obviously, okay. because uh, the last time we did that, that was in the neighborhood of two hundred and. Yeah, I, I six thousand dollars. So yeah, I, I, I remember it being it <laughs> yeah. very expensive, but also very useful. Oh, it, it, yeah. and I agree. So yeah. that's part of their charge. You know, mm -hmm. they they could you know identify the this, right? Possibly. Yeah. yeah. From the need for identify a possible consulting engineer firm. Right. Yeah. We're also in a very different place now than oh, yeah. then. So yes. <laughs> on a study carefully and mm -hmm. right. maybe be more selective in what we we need. 
Exactly. Yeah, I'm not even sure if we need it or not. It's just mm -hmm. if we do, I would like to have the provision in there somewhere that would Absolutely. enable us to. We are no longer basically deal dealing with the great unknown, mm -hmm. needing some intrepid bunch of people to go mm -hmm. out there and hack through the jungle to find out what's buried under everything. Exactly. Um, so I, I think I've outlined it. I don't know if for the public sake, I should quickly go through them or if you're comfortable, uh, you see them there. Um, I'll quickly go through. Identify space needs for the current or future needs of district programs or curriculums. There's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, possible pre-Ks or daycares, as well as um, perhaps some sort of um, uh, staff, you know, new staff or um, housing. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are interesting ideas, but I thought this committee is a committee that sort of delve into that. See if district conference feasible. space. Exactly. Um, in the couple space or in the uh, space where the district office is now, um, create and utilize the design acquisition process. So that worked really well. That was kind of a mainstay of the one. I think why the Wilder project was so successful is this committee uh, very uh, creatively designed uh, a, ma a method for how to select contractors, how to select architects, and, um, you know, based on the needs, based on the wants of the district, and then interviewed, well, asked for applications and designed, and then interviewed selected committees and, you know, so on and so forth. It was really... And that role would be process. similar. It would be similar in this case. Um, and that was part of the reason why I, I think it was suggested that we utilize, you know, the tool because it came together so well. Uh, yes. And it does provide <clears throat> the research capability that, you know, made the decisions of the board uh, a, a lot more um, uh, uh, directed. So... Yeah. Um, the committee also did a really nice job at number four, prepare and organize materials presentation. They mm -hmm. sold. So it's a community committee selling it to the community, not the superintendent or the finance director or a board member um, solely. Um, develop and articulate the argument for a bond uh, to finance any renovation or maintenance project um, and review multi-year maintenance plan, which we just had. So again, it's just a start. It can be amended. Yeah, yeah. It's a way to, way to kick this off. Yeah. Um, I would suggest changing the argument for financing. Leave the type out. So it could be a bond. It could be operational. It could be some other means of mm -hmm. financing it. So I would just suggest you change an argument for financing of any uh, to give. Okay, I'll figure it out. Yeah, mm. right. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, because there is a uh, discussion going on as we speak you know, in reference to the utilization of some of the one-time funds that we have at the state level um, to address some of the construction needs. So yeah. finally, you know, we're at that point. So, um, you know, how it's going to be decided, you know, have the, you're right. I think having a neutral uh, statement in there leaves the committee, you know, the opportunity to work with, um, the administration to move that forward. Right. Okay. So I'm not even sure that whole statement should be there. Mm. No, no I, I think it should. I be. think it's appropriate. Yeah. 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 I, I just want to give them flexibility of. Yeah. yeah. Depending exactly. on what happens in the state house or otherwise, I want to give them as much flexibility for financing, mm -hmm. whether it's application to a bond fund or mm -hmm. what. I made a minor change. I don't know if you can see um, that because it is a Google Doc, but I said develop and articulate the argument for how to finance. Anyway. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Perfect. That works. That works. 
See, I can think on my feet. I just want to <laughs> at least once. <laughs> at least this cool. Once. Cool. <laughs> Whoa. That's the tough, tough, tough audience. Tough audience. Yeah. <laughs> going to go into executive session, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, other than the unanswered question of when we would want this to take place, i.e. the report out date, uh, I think this is just about perfect, mm. and I'm strongly supportive of this approach. Not surprising. Wait. I wonder why. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I thought of changing the date just to June 2020, 2021, but uh, this seems like oh. a lot. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't do it that quickly. Right. Um, I think it seems like it could be a, um, a year's worth of work. It's, it's a big, yeah. it's a big pull. Right. Yeah, I so, would, I would go out a year. Yeah. In, or, 18 that, month, or 18 months. And that makes sense because we're asking those community members for a commitment to of their time, yeah. you know, yeah. and, um, you know, with everybody's stressors being where they are, um, you know, I think uh, having that flexibility of uh, designing the time frame, you know, once the committee formulates is important, you know. I think the committee gets formed and gels and starts to do their work. We'll have a much better idea of the, the pace and the timeline. Exactly. There's nothing you want to rush, but you also yeah. want to leave it so open-ended you miss, yeah. miss opportunities. Well, well yeah. see, that's, but as we know from design, if we do a good job in pulling those community members together, they're going to help uh, us and themselves as move that as it needs to be moved. Yeah. You know the timing of it because that's what happened. You know with the Wilder piece, and, um, and because of some of the funding that's available right now, mm -hmm. um, whether it's grant or uh, state construction funding that we've been sort of promised, yeah. or uh, district uh, fund balance. Yeah. The board may have to short circuit some of the projects. In other words, move, uh, say they want to do a roof or they want to do something at Christian Street because that fits so well into ESSER funds. They right. would be part of this committee. You know, exactly. exactly. A separate sort of cargo that the board mm -hmm. has to deal with between now and you know March, April. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, I, I like the date. I like it. For a couple of reasons, one not the least of which is that our policies require us to have boards that are limited in time and scope, mm -hmm. and and this meets that requirement. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you. Well, you need a vote. Do you need a vote? To, uh, I think we should. Yeah. So a motion. I'd like to move that we authorize the creation of a district facilities planning committee the charter of which has been just discussed. I'll second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion uh, about the motion? Uh, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved unanimously. Thank you. Does, does the board want to uh, entertain now or a future meeting? To who's going to be the board representative? I don't know. You might want to think about that, but um, it'd be nice we, to we, know, can, so. we can give you that um, at the next meeting because we, we will be doing some planning and discussions uh, at the engagement meeting, and that gives everybody a chance to kind of go huh, take a breath and see who might be interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the um, I see we still have Jacob and um, do we want to take a very quick look at the reserve uh, funds um, and balance 
um, since we've created this this committee um, and part of their charge, you know, as you said, since we have uh, one of the reserve funds that has to be expended in a timely fashion uh, and so that we don't get penalized for not using it. Um, so anyways, I'll uh, turn the floor over to Jacob and Jim. So, so right now, uh, the surplus at the end of June, or I should say June 30th, was uh, $3.7 million, $3.8 million. Now, we had a positive surplus for the operation of fiscal year 21 of roughly $460,000. So we have, uh, the, the board has pushed a million dollars of that surplus into offsetting taxes for this next year, 23. So that leaves us with roughly 800,000 that the board could use if it, if it so voted that that they could use it to go towards some projects that the board and superintendent have agreed upon. And we have about 414,000 in the uh, capital reserve uh, fund. And is, is that the one that needs to be expended uh, at the end of this five year period? That one and the Technology, I yes. Yeah. And that money, I think, was earmarked for roofs, if I'm correct. I can't remember, Jim. Didn't we, when we started to accumulate that construction fund money? money? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that was the discussion. And then from the technology, you know, piece, uh, what fed into the uh, approval of the best room project, you know, was having it be able to be multifunctional, you know, right. tech, technologically, right. um, as I recall. Right, that's right. I'm not sure what the board wants to do tonight with that information, but it's certainly going to be pertinent to um, the next meeting. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the purpose, is just to yeah, right. float the balloon, yeah. let our fellow yeah. board yeah. members yeah. Mm -hmm. think about it. And then, and it was, the recommendation was carefully considered because that would still leave two million dollars, which has been stated as important to keep for cash flow reasons. Because for the first semester, we always the, we get the money late in the semester, so we have to fund some stuff. So that was the other part of what, what the recommendation of the finance committee was. Right, and that makes sense. Two million dollars sounds like an enormous amount of money until you've got to pay a couple of payrolls. Exactly, Peter. <laughs> and, That's right. And, and as you as you may re recall, with four hundred and thirty eight employees, our payroll is approximately a million dollars every two weeks. So, uh, with tax anticipation notices um, and the transfer of money from the town because they collect our taxes, the school taxes for us, uh, we need to ensure that. Um, the uh, the district as whole during that process, right. and it sa and it saves. Uh, one of the things that uh, you know when Russ is putting together his presentation for the uh, 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 candidates night and budget night, he'll actually document what that savings is, because there are some districts that borrow money every time they need to do it. And so yeah. every time that you borrow, it, you know, obviously, and every time you borrow 
100,000 here, 200, 400, 500,000 at a clip, that's costing some serious dollars, yeah. you know, uh, especially yeah. for short term. Right. Short term loans are very expensive. Yeah. I, I am loath to do this given the current issues around supply chain and unknown construction costs because of labor shortages and things like that. But that said, there has been real discussion of the best room and of the need to repair the roofs. Yeah. I don't think those are issues that need to be preserved for the committee we have just discussed setting up right, to review right. because there has been ample review of them already. Mm -hmm. And I would look forward to seeing a proposal to make use of the surplus monies to address either one or both of those issues. Mm -hmm. Since since the board had approved that, you yeah, know, previously, right? Yeah, Peter, I don't know if we mentioned, but uh, Tech Center after their uh, surplus has about one point two million, so I think that's a go ahead for the best room as well. Yeah, so I'd like yeah, that was also that. discussed. Yeah, exactly. And I know, uh, yeah, Jonathan is already um, updating the the price, the cost on that project. So we, we did get a price last uh, spring, right? Case, and uh, so now he's updating that with uh, uh, see what the cost is, how much it's going up. And just very, very quickly uh, for uh, the community, uh, this best room uh, is also included in this project. Is the expansion of the health careers. Uh, entities within the tech center. And I think everybody kind of knows what the need is and the demand. Uh, every one of our health careers programs is full uh, and our adult programs are over enrolled. So the fact that we would be able to accommodate even more programming um, because of the partnerships we have, like for example, with DHMC, uh, it just enhances uh, the district's capability to bring that forward. So anyways, that's the Cliff Notes version of the comment. Coach, I just wanna say that I would hate to hog the opportunity to present on candidates night. So if one of my fellow board members <laughs> would be interested, I would step aside graciously. <laughs> What, what, maybe job. maybe we could do a duet or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, somebody have, would like to. I have a question, may I? Sure. And you're the one that will be able to answer this for me for uh, Act 173. Yeah. How will, How is that going to do? I know it's not finished, and it, but I do know it goes into effect in July of next year. And this is the, with the special ed and the independent schools. How is that going to affect our district, if at all? You, uh, that may be something you need to look into first before. I, I would I would defer um, to Jacob and Jim, uh, but what we have found is is that at least the existing um, reimbursements that we have mm -hmm. and the structure for reimbursement and the fact that we operate. Uh, a number of collaborative programs that are special mm -hmm. ed related. Mm -hmm. um, we have been in a pretty uh, cost neutral uh, position. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you say, uh, guys, gentlemen? The, the early, uh, Brad James sent out some early data. And again, I, I guess I, I would be cautious right. and I, I don't think I've changed any numbers in the budget, mm -hmm. but it looked like we were going to get $200,000 more. I don't know that that's a, I wouldn't hang my hat on it and right. I haven't, I haven't changed anything. Is that right, that, <laughs> I, okay. I think that's why it said kind right. of neutral. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, that's fine. Thank you. Definitely. We're supposed to get an update about that at VASBO. So if I hear anything, I'll certainly pass along that information. All right. 
Thank you. It's definitely Thanks. a good question, though, Nancy, to keep on oh, yeah. the PR because yeah. what I've heard in the superintendent world is even if there's an increase in that first year, we want to be very aware of the second year and the third year. Are they going to maintain that same level of funding? Exactly. Act 173, or is there going to be that split? Well, I know it's affecting a lot of the districts yeah. in the state of Vermont. I mean, oh. serious, seriously. And yeah. I thought, I don't even know how it affects my district. Well, they passed the <laughs> so, law two or three years ago, and they haven't implemented it because the funding is so contentious. So that's yeah. a little bit of a concern. Yeah. yeah. Thank I think you it was 2018 much. that they passed that. Right. Exactly. exactly. Funding hasn't been, it hasn't been implemented because of the funding. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. You ready for a calendar? Yes, please. Uh, just, I'm not gonna ask you to approve this tonight, but um, it certainly is much nearer to approval than um, mm -hmm. the last time. Um, it does represent uh, quite a few big changes, but the changes are not something uh, that we're talking about only in Hartford here. The southeast region of Vermont, as well as all the towns that send to the uh, HACTC. So, Mascoma Town, Lebanon, Hanover, Windsor. Um, so, uh, we this this version starts a week later. So, everything's been pushed back or forward. How do you want to look at that? <laughs> Instead of starting on the the 16th of August, the teachers would start on the 24th. Um, working with the teachers union, um, they had a great idea of starting on a Wednesday. So the four days we traditionally have, instead of all being in that first week, three would be in the first week and one would be that following Monday, which we usually have everyone off. Mm -hmm. But we don't start like to start the students mm -hmm. on Monday the first week. So it's a three day week and then a, a one teacher day the next week and four student days. Mm -hmm. And then another four day student week and then we roll right into the year. A big mm -hmm. change in this in this version is um, based on our equity work. Um, we did review this with an equity lens and uh, one of the recommendations was to have um, indigenous people stay off, completely off. So staff and then students would mm -hmm. the holiday, um, which I thought was appropriate. Um, additionally, uh, we gave an extra day at Christmas, um, not Christmas, but at the December break, um, traditionally called the Christmas break. But um, so instead of getting out on the 22nd or 23rd, like this year, it's the 20th. So it's um, nine days. Mm -hmm. People wondered why the second was off. The second of January is a, a legal holiday for the for New Year's. Um, and then we adjusted teacher work days in both um, November and in March. Uh, people really wanted them at the end of the week. This year we did them at the beginning of the week and it was yeah. strange because we had like an early dismissal on a Monday and then no school on a Tuesday for parent-teacher conferences. Mm -hmm. three days. Mm -hmm. um, so we changed that. We also moved the February break. It's a week later to sort of balance out the distance between the weeks uh, that are off. Mm -hmm. April break is the same week. Um, and that's pretty much the changes. Cool. The problem with this is always if you have a, a lot of snow days, um, mm. it gets <laughs> later in June, which can be just yep. as hot as August. So there's yep. always that balance of you start earlier in August uh, and get out earlier, have a little more leeway if the snow days, or do you start later in August and possibly risk going to school through June? But um, this is the definitely the trend both um, uh, Lebanon, Mascoma, Hanover, everyone wanted us to push back to start. The teachers union, the teachers, uh, the administrators. Um, so it seems like it was the only one had concerns was probably me for the reason I just said. <laughs> it's a little exactly. easier if August is warm and you start early than if June is really warm. Everybody is just, you know, 
ready to get out of here. So. <laughs> I always worry about it when it the calendar falls out that such that you do basically two weeks for the Christmas New Year's break because that's an awful lot of time for parents to try to find yeah some way to take care of their kids when they're not yeah. in school yeah um yeah you certainly could add in a day you know the 21st or something yeah um I don't, and i'm not sure if that helps a whole lot yeah, but i know i know it it's, just it's, sort of it's, falls out that way and it, it yeah. becomes very hard if you've got kids that without, you know you got to work and you've got to mm. I, I don't know the solution for it, but I'm aware of the issue. The, well, uh, well, there, the there are why. there are some additional supports um, that are going to be coming to bear, um, you know, as a result of the work of our congressional delegation, uh, and some very substantial funds have been uh, put in place for. Uh, they call it the um, the third hour, uh, and uh, it's that extra part of the day uh, for coverage. And uh, so, anyways, it's uh, it's there, and it's been appropriated. So, the reason I'm not asking, uh, we still have a little bit of work to do with this version. Uh, I began adding, um, not days off but adding indicators on here of uh, religious holidays. Mm -hmm. um, and what the equi district equity team decided to do is do a survey to um, staff, parents, you know, family of, you know, what, what holidays do they celebrate? And we want to begin to um, be much more aware of um, holidays that our families uh, Whole, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, important and at least at the very least at this point um, where we don't have a majority of people who celebrate those holidays but at least recognize and indicate mm -hmm. within our school calendar so teachers and uh, staff are aware that mm -hmm. this important holiday for yeah. a segment of our community yeah, yeah. you students, know that's that's helpful yeah if students are absent uh, you know it's excused if students you know work with work with them so that's a start we're doing i think the survey will go out this week and um mm -hmm. so we should have enough feedback that i can bring this back to you in the first meeting in january with those cap those dates cool. indicated so they would right. highlighted they wouldn't be off but mm -hmm. um given so my we, family's history with that particular problem i appreciate your doing this thank you <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, so, as, so it's always a, again another balance. That's yeah, yeah. the key word tonight. But you know, in in uh, lots of my relatives are teachers in education, and uh, in Rhode Island, um, the Jewish holidays are our days off for the entire district. Right. Uh, I'm not sure our population supports that, but we want to know when we're at mm -hmm. that point where we need to change our calendar mm -hmm. days off. And at the very least, we want to acknowledge those holidays and make sure students are not penalized in any way for being off. And, you know, there's certain holidays where, you know, the staff needs to be aware of it. Yeah, we ended up having to change a, um, a specific day uh, in order to accommodate, um, you know, our colleagues uh, who are Jewish. Um, and it, it was the equitable thing to do, and everybody was mm -hmm. in agreement. So, I have a so, so thank you for your work there, <laughs> Nancy. I'm sorry. So, this has always amazed me ever since I've moved up here. Uh, how come we have a what do we call it here? We call it a winter break and then a spring break. I mean, we've come off of a fairly long break for Christmas and then. A month and a half or two months down mm. the road, then we're off for another week, and then then right, right. and then we're off another week, and so my question is, why? Well, I'm just winter, asking. Winter I don't is, know. Winter is a very long, arduous <laughs> time, and I, and is that I, why we do it? I think some of that falls back historically, you know, into those uh, into that thought. Mm -hmm. um, there are some pretty long, dark cabin related <laughs> periods of time. So, 
Okay. And it also supports you know, actually, Nancy, we discuss it every skiers. year with, with all of the area superintendents. And I definitely think that every year it gains a little more traction mm -hmm. of whether, and I think there's one or two schools in Vermont who do have just one break now. Mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. Yeah. So it's around. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I just it's didn't... it's hard because we we have so many towns that you know we're, we're connected with through this calendar. That's um, I just yeah. didn't know. Yeah. But, uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. So, so thank you. thanks for your input. So we have um, a number of um, uh, monitoring reports and. Uh, I know folks have had a chance to uh, review those. So if there are questions, um, you know, please, we will entertain those. And then we will ask for a motion uh, to accept the reports. I did not update the EO10 one. If you remember, you uh, asked me to do that back in I think it was October. Right. Uh, no, right. September. Yeah. Uh, much different to report now. If there are no questions, I would like to move that we accept the monitoring reports for EL10, B slash SR3, and GP7. Second. Um, just a quick comment, uh, not necessarily discussion. Um, you know, EL10 is continually updated, uh, especially uh, being as new as it is. Uh, and Roy and Kathy and Tom uh, and Maggie have been involved in ensuring that uh, we get continuous, uh, you know, commentary on how we're moving. So, uh, thank you all, and and give our thanks to Maggie too when you uh, when you run into her. So, so that being said, um, unless there's any other comments about EL10 or any of the other ones, uh, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. So I see we still have some uh, public uh, uh, community members with us. Uh, there are also about 11 questions in the question and answer right. tab on that. So let's, let's do public comment and let's ask for uh, those folks that are still here if they'd like to uh, comment and then we'll uh, review the questions. Uh, at least uh, so we can document those so that we know if we need to uh, bring them forward at the next community engagement meeting. So Roy, can you give us a hand with those uh, community yep. folks? No new, no new ones than the previous 11 that were there that, that Peter had noticed prior. Some, some are associated with a, with a name and some are somewhere anonymous at the very beginning of the meeting before Tom mm -hmm. mentioned it. You want what we have for comments and questions? Sure, sure. Okay. All right, so um, I think there was one around the population but we of uh, what full attendance would be, but Tom, Tom addressed that. Mm -hmm. Michelle Bolesky has a question around, um, let's see. My question is, if there is a threat to a school, whether it is an active shooter or a bomb, how does the neighborhood surrounding the campus get alerted? What is the policy? Question. You want me to provide an answer or wait till? Well, well, I, I think what you've said before, you, you do have a, uh, a procedure. Uh, and the good thing about procedures is they're adaptable uh, to meet the need. Uh, so let's put that as we will answer that uh, at our next meeting. 
Roy? Yep, next question. Uh, next is a comment from Doug Cussius. Uh, volunteers for cleaning, prep work, et cetera. I don't think anyone's imagining volunteers being student facing. Uh, for those who don't know, he's the White River uh, principal. Yes. Uh, next, next one's a comment from Christina Tardy. The actual CLA from the from state of Vermont from the Equalized study will be available by January 1st, 2022. And those are the questions. Uh -huh. Questions and comments. Great. Okay. Um, any, any board members um, uh, or administration care to uh, make a comment before we um, move to uh, um, board professional development because that will be fairly quick. I have one quick comment, please. Sure. I, che I checked with Lisa O'Neill about this when everything was happening here at the high school. And I said, what's the procedure if we're up there in a meeting and some crazy comes barreling through that front door? What is, what is the town's procedure? She said, you know, I don't think there is one if you're in a meeting. They, the town itself has a procedure and they're, they're pretty well covered. She explained a bunch of it to me. But she says, but we don't have one in case you guys are up here in a board meeting and someone who is irate or just way out there. So I think that's something that we, I would like for us to look at and maybe think about what we should be doing or how we could handle that situation. I mean, look at all of this, all this glass around us. They can see everybody that's here. And I'm not sure those glass, that well, those windows are bulletproof. <laughs> uh, but I just, I, it just brought to my attention that I'm a little bit concerned about that because people are so stressed mm -hmm. and they get so emotional about it. Right. I don't do that, of course. Okay. So, <laughs> so I guess what I'm going to suggest is, since that's a public comment mm -hmm. uh, with a question attached, mm -hmm. uh, that we can ask um, the administration to add that to our list of responses. Okay. Thank uh, you. So that we have a response for it, uh, because you. there is a protocol in place. Uh, it's just that we haven't been shared what that protocol is, you know, what do you do? Does everybody dive underneath the, the desk that's there? Uh, is that, it, no, I, I mean, we don't, we don't know what the procedure is. I know. Uh, and uh, for security reasons, right. Uh, we shouldn't get into detail, but so, having the answer of the procedure is critical. So that would be my only other comment is, okay. is that, uh, we might not make it public that, right. you know, this is the procedure, you know, we're all going to get Kevlar. And, <laughs> uh, but... Got it. Thank you, Kurt. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. But we will resolve the question. And thank you, because that was a good question. <laughs> so when we get back to, you know, full time, everybody's there, you know, we know. Right. Okay. Um, board professional development, um, we have, um, uh, in our schedule, you know, another upcoming, um, uh, piece with Mary, uh, but I think that comes after tax season. Uh, <laughs> I wonder who that's for. <laughs> no, 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 no. Did I say that out loud? No, no. I, I, no it was on the calendar specifically. <laughs> <laughs> the ease stress, ease stress, you know, there you go. Uh, and then, you know, our community engagement is continuous professional development for the board. Uh, and Nancy's been doing a great job with the VSBA for us as far as updates uh, with information that's available for our individual uh, consumption. So that's really good. And so the consent agenda. Two lengthy sets of minutes. 
lot to read, bro. There were no resignations, hirings, or anything else we need to worry about? No. Wonderful. Seeing no hands raised or anything, I'd like to move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. So we have a motion in the second to accept the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Uh, Tom did put a copy of our meeting evaluation in. Uh, it was one of the seven attachments. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't move too quick to adjourn because we need to discuss the next meeting date. No, no, no. Uh, we figured we'd do the. Uh, going to cut me off by specialty play. <laughs> no, as soon as you do the eval, he is going to move to adjourn. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so 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 before we do the evaluation, um, <laughs> you know, customarily, you know, we've done one of two things. We've either met one of the days next week or we didn't meet with the holiday because our fourth Wednesday is really close to the day that the person who looks like me right now, um, you know, shows up. See, actually, that's what I'm going to do for a little extra cash. You know? <laughs> anyway, there is um, a shortage of Santa Claus. Yes, there are. <laughs> So it's it's perfect timing. Perfect mm -hmm. timing. Um, so I I guess um, one of the uh, questions was um, Wednesday didn't seem um, to work for a lot of folks uh, next week, but we thought that maybe if we did decide, um, the optional day would probably be Tuesday. Uh, because the, you know Wednesday's the like the last day, and we lose everybody. You know, not lose everybody, but you know that's we should be sending people off. Tuesday, the uh, December fourteenth. Yes, I won't be here. Yeah, we're moving the meeting up a week, so that it's not, not in that shortened uh, for the vacation week. We're moving it to next week. But if if we have, you know, part of the discussion and the reason for it is, and, and we've had this occur before, you know, if we did decide to forego, um, you know, that meeting, we would, um, you know, address agenda items um, differently for the first meeting in January. I will not be in town, nor will I have access to be able to get on on that day. Okay. Not that that means anything, but that's just. Yeah. Well, it does. One of us, yes. <laughs> it's part of the decision. All right. So what, what, would the be, what would the um, community engagement topic be for the next meeting? Well, well, it was going to be around budget. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, so that's why, you know, we could feasibly. Uh, construct the agenda a little differently uh, for that first meeting uh, to include those budgetary items that we would like to uh, address. When do we start going into the town budget conversations that usually tend to take place mid-year, I mean, around this time of year? Do we have anything scheduled? Yes. What's the cycle calendar? Yeah, I haven't put a uh, put it together in one page, but I do have the dates in my calendar. So, if we were going to propose a um, a bond, I think that was um, coming up in the beginning of January. Warrant information night would be the tenth of January. Right, it's usually that first week. Yeah. Uh, okay. As far as um, let me find the next one because I know it's in here. I've got February. Budget discussion is February 21st. Okay, so that's the base out. Yeah. That's the ways out. Budget discussion that's candidates night. Mm. Right. Seven o'clock. Yeah. In the auditorium. Um, I would. Yeah. 
just I don't keep... see anything of huge urgency. Uh, we do need to. Um, so we've we've. Do we need to do any action? I guess is a question mm -hmm. regarding the proposed uh, course of action made by the superintendent and assistant superintendents today at an upcoming meeting, or do we just accept that under policy governance, they've explained what we wish to do, and then we will proceed with it. And our only role is to consider how that addresses policy or not and figure whether we wish to comment, because that would be the driver for me. So I guess, Peter, in order to, um, uh, to move that question, because we didn't um, when we got uh, the state of the district response, mm -hmm. um, I guess at that point we could have taken, because there were two asks within that presentation. And all we need to do is say we support. And part of the reason, you know, you know, I left that that line, you know, on the chart, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that I put together is, do we support the administration? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we agree that it was a thoughtful uh, and uh, respectful and transparent process, you know, to the community engagement meeting of, you know, the 23rd, we could make a motion to uh, vote in support of the administration in their work to mitigate uh, the climate concerns of the mm -hmm. district. And I certainly would be supportive of such a move. I thought it was responsive. It did take into account the feedback we had received it seemed an appropriate response. Uh, and since our job is not to get into the fine tuning, but just general direction and strategic approach, uh, I thought that that had been met, but I wasn't sure if we were wanting to do, to do anything about it now or we wanted to wait for another round of community engagement or not. Uh, so... Well, I think I think hearing, you know, hearing from us that mm -hmm. that comment that you just made and making it formal, uh, right. since it is a public document now, mm -hmm. um, you know, the report from the superintendent and the administration. Right. Uh, I, I would say that that would pretty much, uh, uh, you know, cover All right. that. Person. Right. So then. I would like to move that we vote in support of the response to community engagement PowerPoint presentation and the comments made by the superintendent during his state of the district report and uh, that we urge them to move forward on that. I'll second that. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, unless there's any further discussion, Just I see a hand, I see a hand. I, I would like to suggest that maybe a monthly or a periodic update yeah. as to the yes. progress would be appropriate. Not as elaborate as the wonderful presentation right. that was done tonight, but just some kind of real quick update. Not every meeting, but once a month or something. That, that is that a friendly amendment? It's a uh, very Mr. friendly amendment. Mr. Merrill? <laughs> I accept it as such. <laughs> okay. So we have a friendly amendment, you know, from uh, Russ and Nancy. Do you accept that friendly I amendment? I certainly do. <laughs> as the second? Yes. So, so, so we have uh, that as part of the amendment. Uh, and all in favor of the proposed amendment and the vote please say aye aye aye, aye.
Opposed? That done. Sorry. It, it was unanimous. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And that done, I don't see a crying need to meet next week. And I would propose that we uh, resume our business in the new year. I'll second that. <laughs> I, can't know, yeah, I, anyway. I, I don't see. I don't see people lining up with sticks and no, no. Uh, <laughs> you, you did. It, you did do an extra meeting in November. Usually, right. you had this problem in November and mm. in December. And this November, you scheduled and had a very hearty meeting on the twenty third. So yeah, yeah. You shouldn't, you shouldn't feel remiss and skipping. Yeah. And I mean, no. and actually, it's going to probably be more productive because we may have more of the information. Yeah necessary it, to give a thoughtful discussion of the budget so exactly yeah. exactly you know especially with what came out you know from the uh mm -hmm. joint fiscal office today mm -hmm. so um the other day um i don't know if that's a done deal but thank you very much that's like a little present to me <laughs> it's been quite a full early winter for all of us so I appreciate that. Do we vote on that? Or do we just... We did. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think I think we're good. Um, okay. The so, other thing just coach that you should uh, I want to get out there is February 26th uh, is a Saturday. That's town meeting day. It's a little early, but yeah. 26th hmm. then... instead of March, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Yep. And tend to whatever uh, and then voting is uh, March 1st so Tom if you wouldn't mind uh, there is one task that I would like to ask or make a request would you just mind sending those dates and please include you know just draft and just as a oh, bulleted yeah. no, thing great. not a big formal thing uh, and also include uh, when the petitions have to be in uh, mm -hmm. for those running for the three-year terms yeah i think there's I, two board members correct yeah uh, correct kevin and nancy mm -hmm. i think it's how I me that. don't ask me no how peter I too i think no, no me yeah, yeah. yeah. peter peter yeah yeah i believe so, it's me i lose yeah. get track of this easily but okay so i'm not right Peter so nancy. so I if you can that. if you can I, you know just okay. share the you know that date um you know, that way we can get the forms that we need from uh, our town clerk and go from there. It's a little trickier in COVID to, to get <laughs> signatures. So, you know, because, you know, standing on a corner in a mask isn't really. <laughs> Come and help me. No, no, nah, I'm not even talking <laughs> Tin can out there with. <laughs> <laughs> well, last year you didn't need signatures because of the state of emergency. Right, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Are you so, calling the meeting evaluation or doing? Yes. yes. Somebody else, please do it this time. I think if I did it the last cycle. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You do it. All righty. I'd love nothing less. <laughs> All right. So I'm doing the meeting evaluation at the end of each board meeting. The, the superintendent and the board evaluate and complete this monitoring reform. The board was prepared for the meeting. I would say satisfactory. Board's time was spent on ends, not means. Satisfactory. Each board member was given an opportunity to participate. Satisfactory. Board treated all persons with courtesy and fairness. Satisfactory. R board adhered to Robert's rules of order as appropriate and as needed. Satisfactory. <laughs> the board adhered to its adopted governance style. It emphasized outward vision. It encouraged diversity and viewpoints. It exercised strategic leadership, not administrative detail. It maintained distinction between board and staff roles. It used collective decision-making and it looked to the future. Satisfactory. With that, yes. Nancy, would you like to do the honors? Oh, 
Yeah. Make a motion. We adjourn. <laughs> second. So we have a motion in the second to adjourn and to all of our teachers and staff and especially our administration. Um, happy holiday. Um, and a job well done keeping our kids and districts safe. So you're here. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. And thank you all of you. It's hard to believe we're here. <laughs> Just... Amazing. Thank you. Have a good night. You uh, as well. Tom, Take care. Tom, would you call me when you get a second break? Sure. Thank you. <laughs>